OTB's The Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship. You are very welcome along to The Hurling Pod, our first live edition with Board Gosh Energy. They are the proud sponsors of the All Ireland Championship and the Legends Tour Series at Croke Park. Paul Murphy is going to be one of those legends very soon indeed, but yet one of our listeners, Murph. Thought the own Murphy up on this point. This is a confusion of me not using Paul before I say your name. Uh, so congratulations on continuing your career as a Kilkenny goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. I didn't get much credit there during the week. Owen Murphy was getting all the credit there for the hurling pod. And more importantly, putting up at Skehill. They have to give him uh, Owen Murphy all the credit there. But look, here, I'm used to that. I'm used to that at this stage. That's my life. Your, your lives would be a lot more, <laughs> lot less more boring without me. <laughs> Well, certainly for around an hour and a half a week, it probably would be. I think the rest of my life would probably survive. Skell, how are you getting on? I'm tremendous. <laughs> I had a busy weekend on the farm, so I had to, just, I had to pack in some hurling. And a lot, a lot of hurling it was. Like, it, was, it, was a, it was a good weekend, I thought. A good way to start off the yeah. championship. Well, like yeah. Championship I mean, black cards came back this weekend. We were only decrying the lack of them a few weeks ago that refs didn't seem to be giving them anymore. We had a red card, huge incident uh, with Gerald Hegarty in the Limerick game. Uh, we had loads of goals in Ennis between Clare and Tipperary. And we had a closely fought game, particularly between Antrim and Dublin yesterday. So, you know, the hurling gods have been kind to us on the first weekend, scale. Yeah, it's just it's just unfortunate that we couldn't get to see all the games. <laughs> you know, like especially yesterday, I thought with the amount of hurling that was going to be on show, at least our national broadcaster would have one game. But yes, uh, they might have thought it wasn't important enough. <laughs> are you are you trying to say you don't enjoy URC games with three rounds left where teams are playing half teams? Oh, You'd God, prefer yeah. to see championship hurling over that, would you? Yeah, especially coming from my neck of the woods anyway. Yeah, if you throw in a rugby ball over here, it'll get burst. <laughs> but it's almost as bad as a football. <laughs> and I just thought they could do better. Like I, I thought it quite ironic Like when you consider that the GEA go, GEA go app is, or subscriptions, what is it, 80 bob? For the uh, seventy nine at the moment, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you're basically you're basically paying eighty bob to say for for the for the two months, and there was absolute uproar over Sky at the time they did the deal. Now, in fairness, Diego, the coverage is good. Like the pundits are good, the commentary is good. I particularly like Tom, I, I like Tommy Walsh yesterday. I thought he was excellent as a co-commentator. Commentator. Um, it's just that I suppose it's not that it's difficult to, to get into, but it's you know tricky enough around these neck of the woods where Wi-Fi is a bit slow. Well, I was in good Wi-Fi today and it misfired for me on the phone for the game between Clare and Tipperary. I had great intentions of flicking it on and by the time that I turned it on, Tipperary already had two goals gone in. Uh, so I had to wait and look at them online uh, to get a look at them. And I don't know, goalkeepers uh, union here, Skell. That was a six-point head start that was effectively handed to Tipperary with the two soft goals conceded early on. Yeah, it was, and I, I I really felt for him because you know goalkeepers making mistakes is one thing, but then making back to back mistakes on your championship debut that, that's a tough one to, to swallow. Like, and it just got me thinking. I was like, why? You know, if you, if you got a goalkeeper, and this is no disrespect now to him, but if you got a goalkeeper who is absolutely fundamental or critical to a team's game plan, whether it be through a hook out strategy or whatever, fair enough. I can see the switch. You know, I can see why you change one, but I didn't see an awful lot as to why Eva Quilligan wouldn't be in the goals. You know, like. He's, he, I, I thought he's performed pretty well over the last couple of years, and I thought he was going to be number one again this year. So, look, he he learned a harsh lesson today. Like the, the, the five goals, not all his fault, of course, but the first two, especially, or if not, maybe even three, when you consider the sharp book out, he looked back at them and he'd be thinking, God, I, I got things wrong. And the, tr- the trouble was, there wasn't any look about it. It was just bad execution on three elements from himself. Like for the first one, his positioning was poor for the sideline. The second one, he got dispossessed, and when he had the ball, the third one then. He overshot, I believe. Was John Connell or Paul Flanagan? John for, Connell. For, for, yeah, now you can yeah. probably say that John could have gone with the hurl. He went to try, try to catch it and, and it led to the goal. So, but ultimately, like so three costly errors and, and they, they just couldn't claw back after that. Yeah, we're looking at all the live comments uh, coming in at the moment as well. So uh, we will work our way through these as we go along. This tech is all very new to us. Uh, we're going live. Uh, Patrick Coleman, not sure if this is Shane Stapleton in disguise. Tip her back. Another big chance for Waterford to beat this Limerick team. Missed big time. Limerick looked to be sailing along when they almost fell apart, fell over the line, thanks to Waterford. It's jumping around a little bit, Murph, but I wonder how much Waterford will feel that that Limerick team, especially after Hegarty was sent off, were potentially there for the taking on weekend one. Yeah, absolutely. And just looking at my notes here, Watford, I have them marked down for 13 wides, you know. Um, at, at important times of the game, particularly after Hegarty was sent off, there certainly was times, and thinking of one Desi Hutchinson point, you know, from not a bad position, that really what Watford were looking there was not just the score, but the bit of momentum that would have really had Limerick maybe scrambling. Because at important times there, 
when let's say Waterford got to pump up Limerick just got that score to kind of stem the tide a small bit um, so when you look at 13 wides on Waterford's side there Waterford will definitely look at that and say you know when, when you look at only losing by a few points you can look at your wides then and say were we as economical as we should have been so I think that Waterford definitely win but isn't it brilliant that we're sitting here and certainly from a Waterford point of view that we're actually sitting here saying that small margins there and we would have had Waterford turning over Limerick team which Last week on the pod, we were saying we couldn't see happening for a very long time. Mm. So, you know, picking through it, there's a lot for Watford. And this wasn't anything we had seen from Watford in the league. You know, we'd been speaking, you can only work off what you what you see in the league. And Watford never sh- showed us this. And it's brilliant that they did. And it's unfortunate, again, I know we'll get to it. Tyke the Burka, you know, dropping out of the game. Looks like his season is over. They had a chance to win the game. There's so many things that is it's great for Watford. Not to say it's a moral victory, but to come away saying we could have beaten the All Ireland champions, this supposedly unbeaten team, you know. So that's a huge launching pad for Watford. Yeah. But I definitely do think they'll walk away from this going, missed chances, we could have won this game. Yeah, I'm not sure whether John Colley was talking directly about this idea that Limerick are ruining hurling, or he was hitting back at the idea that a lot of people were saying that they were going to be unbeatable this summer. And we were getting comments last week, Gal, about you know potentially teams not getting within <clears> ten <throat> points of them this summer, and you were both of the feeling that that would not be the case, as it proved today a very close game between them and Waterford. But I'm um, just reading Kylie comments here. Quote: Let's be honest about it. There was some amount of bullshit spouted about our team ahead of this week and the week before. It's a softening up exercise mentally from those who are outside our camp but we've been around a long time we know it's all folly and nonsense every day you go out you're there to be beaten we saw that again today a couple of chances go left right on you and you're in a different situation and we could have lost that game every day we go out we think we could possibly be beaten that's just the way that we think about things so i think there was a lot of nonsense and i think people might hopefully have a bit more reality about their perspective and their analysis about where things are going just maybe focus more on the fact we're playing claire next weekend we played them for nearly 100 minutes last year and there wasn't a puck of a ball between us same in ennis last year as well what do you think skell is this a way of um john Kiley sure, keeping say, his team focused or he has to say that like that, that, that that'd be the same message you hear from every manager over a top level team who were to be honest going through a period of domination like and what whatever what was said about limerick over the last number of weeks like is is deserved you know they deserve to be to be touted as, as one of the greatest teams of all times one of the greatest sporting teams even in terms of what they're winning and you know, but I think he has to say to try and like neutralize all the all the fanfare and neutralize all the, you know, the I suppose all the, the conversations that every pundit and every person is having about Limerick. So like, it's it's a, it's smart by Kylie. He has to do it. He has to say it. Otherwise, if he if he comes in and says, yeah, look, we're we're in a great situation. We're going to roll through people. You know, it's only given you know fodder to the opposition teams uh, where he put but like um, I think it's deserved. Like and. Like they got through a real hard game today, um, in, in the sense that everything was kind of thrown at them. You know, I thought Waterford tried to play the game at a pace, like they didn't want Limerick to get up and get rolling, get moving, so they, they kind of slowed it down. Um, I found it very interesting. Like this, I think I was going back through the games we were saying before how Limerick are 16 games unbeaten. This is now 17, but this is the lowest they've scored in those 17 games. I think 118 over over all those. Like so, it just it kind of shows me that like Waterford played really, really compact and tried to neutralize Limerick and not get them up ahead of steam and you know they played ultra defensively but just didn't have it up top so but a, a good effort a valiant effort I think you know David Fitz would be delighted with with his team's effort um devastated obviously with Tiger Brooks injury but again it's it's a good second stone for Waterford moving forward that they have you know a, 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 I know they got beaten but they've been mentioned after a good performance yeah it's kind of one of those Paul where they go into their mini break now get ready for the game against Cork after the week off They've shipped the expense of the Tug de Burke injury, so that's the anchor to their defence loss for the rest of the championship, unfortunately. Uh, David Fitzgerald confirmed uh, later on this evening uh, that he suffered an Achilles injury. Um, he was saying he's gutted for him, that he's basically been fighting to get back for the last four or five months in his rehab from his last injury, and then to go out the first day of championship and have to come off is a very hard blow for him. But for Waterford, in a more general sense, Stephen Bennett's back scoring, scored from play again today. Um, Desi Hutchinson's position is maybe becoming a little bit clearer. And like as some of our commenters are pointing out, uh, for example, this one, Calum Lyons destroyed Lynch today. I'm not sure if you'd say destroyed, but uh, Lynch's impact was definitely curtailed during the game. Lots of positives for Waterford to take. Yeah, lots of positives and lots of things that I think people uh, people thought couldn't be done to this Limerick team. And like, if you looked at the five five of the Limerick forwards that scored after 19 minutes, and the only person was Keane Lynch. Uh, I don't have Keane Lynch down for a score here either. 
And it was evident, you know, about 50 minutes into the game, I was kind of saying to myself, I haven't seen a whole lot of Keane Lynch there. No, he was on the ball at times, and he was on the ball, typical Keane Lynch style, in real tough, rock areas, popping the ball out, but not as influential as we've seen in other games, which is probably, you know, a real, a real compliment to Waterford and how they actually decided to hold him up, because the best you could hope for in any game of Keane Lynch is just that he's not as influential. I don't think you're going to keep keep him completely out of the game. But they just stemmed the tide of him being able to pop the ball off to lads left and right. Any time he seemed to get the ball, he was surrounded by two or three players, you know, which is risky at times because it means other players are having to leave their men to go and surround him. But nevertheless, Watford did it really well in a way that once they got to him, they made sure he wasn't getting the ball off into maybe a goal-scoring opportunity or different things. But... It, it's um it's it's encouraging and I think other teams will certainly look at what was done today uh to see let's say preparing for Keane Lynch in future because if you can keep him quiet some of the other Limerick forwards kind of have to rely on fighting for their own ball and maybe scrapping in around the middle as well you know if you think of like the likes of Bonner Mara for Tipperary for years would have done a lot of that hard graft get the ball pop it off to lads and players also knew when he was getting the ball similar to Keane Lynch that he's going to look for a pass, he's going to look for a run off the shoulder, he's going to use the ball well, etc. So I think teams will look at this and go, okay, what was done today with Keane Lynch that we can bring going forward? Because if you can do that, it's like TJ Reid with Kilkenny, you know, it's 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 like Patrick Horgan with Cork. Teams will identify one particular player that if we can hold him, well, that could be a launching pad. But, you know, there is, and there's so many things, you look at Warford's performance today that, you know, really good stuff and, re- and stuff that I think a lot of teams have struggled to deal with. Um, they even created a few goal opportunities, you know, which, again, teams have been saying it's very tough to create goal opportunities. You may say that some of them were unorthodox in ways, just, you know, a few balls going in, breaking, but that's, you know, you have to work with what you have. So there's definitely a good few things that, you know, I think people will be sifting through this going, there's things we can take from this, and if we're having a tilt at Limerick, we can we can copy a good few of these things. Mm-hmm. All right, Skell, explain to me then, what did we see from that Waterford performance that maybe Claire could copy in six days' time ahead of what feels already like a must-win game for them. So, the, so you always talk about the middle third, but even this was smaller. So, uh, uh, what Waterford did is they pulled back all the bodies, uh, as, or as many bodies as they could, like fourteen behind the ball and left one, one man up top. So, what you had is you, you just you had absolute wars over in the middle. And I think it's the first time in again, by my note now when I go back through the, the shot count, like Waterford got more shots than Limerick. They only thirty-one shots, like Limerick. That's that's something we haven't seen with Limerick in I, I go as far as saying three or four years. You know, we're, we're, we've grown so accustomed to uh, to Limerick scoring, excuse me, shooting 50 shots, soccer, give or take, that, you know, it's nearly like, it's normality. We're 31. They just congested the area really tight. They they put in so many bodies. They put in a Trojan effort in fairness, and Watford are fit. They are fit. Like, they 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 put pace where they had to have pace. Barry Nash's influence was, I won't say curtailed, but at least it was kind of minimised to a lower level than what has been in the past. He, he did come away with a point, which, fair enough. Um, but... The influencers, like, like like Paul was saying, Keane Lynch, like Callum Lines, I wouldn't say cleaned him, like, but especially in the second half where Nicky was hitting, it seemed he seemed to hit puck outs down on top of Lynch and Lines a good bit, and Lines came away with you know, three out of the four. Uh, so it was like big players did 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 Waterford's big players did good jobs on on, on Limerick's big players. So we didn't see a major influence from Hegarty. You know, Tom Morrissey was, was was pretty good in fairness, but Lynch didn't do much. Killian was effective-ish, you could say, from open play. You know, Donahue, Donovan. Didn't get an awful lot to say. Burns didn't get his usual ten shots and <laughs> six points, you know. So I just think the the, the crowd was out, uh, made it really really difficult for Limerick to get through. Uh, hit everything that moved. In fairness, there was a woeful tackle count and just came short. But the problem with that is it's very defensive. So like nineteen points is not going to get you over the, over the line with Limerick because they again they just have such quality over the pitch that they can make make things happen. So like I don't know would that would that plan work for Clare? I don't think at all it definitely won't work for Clare because we see today. That even the drop off and try run through, uh, likes to very the, the full forward line stroke a big time for Clare, and that that it's hugely important to have a full forward line that's effective, whether it be Gawick, Kenny, or TJ on Cody, or you look at to T- with Jake Morris and, and Jason Ford. You have to have guys the inside square that can that can hold the ball, change the ball, and have a goal threat, and that just didn't materialize for 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 Waterford too much yesterday. So it's food for thought for them. Yeah, Murphy, you picked last week your one two three five for Munster. You didn't have Waterford qualifying. Do you reevaluate that based on what you saw over the seventy minutes today? Um, it well, like the only thing I'd be reevaluating would be I think I think I'd Watford on bottom and I'd I'd, call, I'd Clare um, fourth. You know, you look at the Clare game and you kind of see Watford at the moment look like they know a little bit more what they're about than Clare. I still want to see a small bit more from from Watford. Like I associate teams who play Limerick 
come with their A game every single day and they're switched on. You know, you could say in the league final, Kilkenny didn't do that, but his championship now and anything we've seen from teams over the last few years playing Limerick or just playing the All Ireland champions in general is that they come very focused, they come very driven, very aggressive, and really have a tilt at it. And that's what Watford did today. But it's going to be, I suppose, uh, it, it, it's going to be a challenge now for Watford to see how do they pick themselves up now for the next game, go at it, do they go about the business, or do they tune in for the next game as, as, as much as they tune in for this Limerick game? You know, because at the end of the day, you still have zero points on the board. So wait and see. You know, I mean... This time last year, I think Cork had zero points on the board after two games, but then turned it around in their third game and then, you know, kicked on. So it's, I, I still want to see a small bit more from this Walsh team. Like, I mean, excellent performance today. And like I said, stuff we hadn't seen from them in the league. But again, it's one game and they still have zero points on the board. So they definitely, you know, it's going to be tough as well to Tyg de Burke. That's another thing they're going to have to deal with now at the moment because they, they, they had no time to think today. Tyg de Burke was gone, no time to think. They just had to go at him and stay going at Limerick. Nevertheless, they did a great job. But now they have to prepare for life without Tyke Burke, which is not an easy thing for Watford. They have to fill that centre back position. Austin Gleeson is still to come back in. So, you know, they still have options there. Do they maybe push someone back, drop Austin Gleeson into the middle and actually start him the next day? There is options there. But for me at the moment, you know, I never let one game just decide that, oh, yeah, that's it. This team is back. So it's, um, I, think, I think time will tell it's more about more Watford. Yeah, Colin Cronin making a very reasonable point on this as well. Lads, can we say a bit of deja vu from last year, albeit it was the second round of games from Waterford lost to uh, Limerick that time around. Uh, losing pushed them to pin their collar and then the flame went out. Hope not, but De Burke is a huge loss. Um, the circumstances are a little bit different, Skell, but there is always that possibility that this was a really good performance from Waterford, but one that they have to back up or otherwise it is still going to be very difficult for them to qualify here. Yeah, but I, I like I give credit to Waterford because they they came into this game in a difficult position. You know, no, no one gave them a prayer. I don't think anyone would have backed Waterford. <laughs> Nobody. No. So for them to come in and produce a pretty pretty good performance, and I won't say negate Limerick, but even did, did a really good job in them. You know, it's it's, it's positive. So it's a step in the right direction. Um, and <clears throat> the thing is, they've learned. They, they surely have learned lessons last year on that that effort has to be up now. That they, they can't rest in their laurels. So I just I wonder so, a couple of things about them though because like Ozzy Gleeson like. What's the situation with him in the sense that like, if he's good enough, fit enough, should I say, to come on, surely he's fit enough to start. Like, now, mm. Even look at the league situation. He seemed to play, let's call it a bit part, coming on here, coming on there. So like, if, you're, if Waterford are moving forward, especially with Tiger de Burke, you're, you're going to have to see Ozzy Gleeson get in there somewhere. Now, does he go centre-back? Now the Tiger's injured. We saw him there last year. Does, does Jack Fager kind of lines moving there? So there's probably a small bit of rejigging to do, um, but they have to get him on the pitch big time. And like, look, as I said, they can, they can take a load of positives from today's game, but uh, again, it counts for nothing. Zero points. Is Gleeson not better used, though, scale further up the pitch? Like, surely you want to get him involved as close to the opposition goal as opposed to sitting back at six? Yeah, like, I don't know. My, my count, like, I, I have him for eight possessions here when he came on, right? And of those eight possessions, he got three in the full, three, in, three inside the opposition 45 and five outside of it. So I'm not sure where he's been deployed. Is he be, is he been... Like we saw him in the square kicking, <laughs> nearly kicking over a point. Then he was doing a lot of deliveries. Like his long range shooting is excellent. His deliveries, his striking is fabulous. His catch is excellent. So you can utilize him anywhere, to be honest. But I think the way Watford are playing, where the, where the whole team is kind of sat back, it doesn't really make much sense to have Ozzy up there, up top by himself. Because look at he's not the, he's not a Jesse Hutchinson type speed player. So you're talking about the ball going down top of him. Whereas I think he'd be more utilized in the middle area, whether it be the halfback in the midfield, in uh, dispersing the ball. So, but again, Things might change because, like Tig's injury, that's that's a huge void to fill for a team like Waterford, who counts him so much for possession. So, I, I think you could potentially see him centre back. I'm not sure who would fill that void because you see Lines and Fagan are so effective on the wings moving forward, whereas you need someone to sit back. And again, Ozzy has the skill set and the striking to do it and the brain because he's a he's an intelligent hurler too. So, I'd say horses for courses, and this course requires Ozzy to go back centre back. Paul, who are you putting in the Waterford Six jersey for two weeks' time? Ken McGrath. <laughs> Never, a bad, <laughs> Never <laughs> a bad shout. Never a bad shout. Tony Brown is going to come in, I think, uh, wing back, seven, <laughs> so push them across. Like you could see realistically, um, you know, Caleb Lyons could fill that quite well. I think we saw Jack Fagan and Caleb mm -hmm. Lyons on the two wings. But, you know, Caleb Lyons, he, he's been excellent for Waterford really over the last, you know, couple of years. He has the athleticism to drive straight through the middle. We've seen he's excellent in the air, well able to go forward and take a score. So potentially what Davey looks at is 
you know, pushing Callum Lines into the centre, doing a great job on Keen Lynch today, and then maybe put another runner in the channel on, on five. You know, they, they have plenty of lads there. Like, they do have a good panel, and they do have lads sitting on the bench there that have a good energy um, are able to work them channels as well. So I think what potentially we'll see happen here, I, I don't see myself, Austin Gleeson, going back centre-back. I think the furthest we'll see him go back is maybe midfield and have him pushing onto the goal that, that way. But I, I'd agree with Skell. I don't see him going in full forward either. Like I mean, we saw Kyle Hayes being like Robocop, chasing him down for the goal. Yeah. And I think where Austin Gleeson, you need him out in the middle of the field. He, he's a player who can get on ball, like Skell said. Like he's in, in that middle third where you have your half back line, midfield and half forward line. Those players should also be your best players that are able to get on the ball in tough positions and find themselves on the ball. Austin Gleeson is one of those. And I think in those positions, not only for his shooting ability, but also for his ability to open up the game in terms of looking up and providing a great pl- a pass for like, the likes of Desi Hutchinson. So I think what happens the next day is possibly that Caelan Lyons goes in towards centre-back and then we see someone slotting into the right half-back position then um, and potentially a fairly, like Davey might look at it from point of view of getting a bit more of an attacking player going in wing-back, but that, that being their launching pad for going up the channels to get a few more scores. So I think, uh, I don't see Austin Gleeson sitting in there. Mm. Uh, we've also got uh, Tom from Dublin over on the Facebook. A couple of uncharacteristic wides from Hutchinson down the straight uh, didn't help matters. What did you make of Hutchinson's performance, Gal? Because this year, pretty much everything about Desi at Intercounty has discussed how deep he's been playing. We saw the stats, uh, particularly with the amount of possessions that he was receiving between the 45s as opposed to being close to the opponent's goal. What do you think of Desi's performance today? Um, it was better because he, again, he was closer to the goal. Um, but I saw a very, uh, was it like an interesting tweet if I just find it, if you know, I got the exact wording. Um, bear with me for a second. It was from Sean Flynn. <clears throat> you know, the he, he does like analysis and, and uh, statistics. On, performance, on yeah. Twitter. Yeah, so he's very good. But he had a very interesting tweet that I said. So essentially, he, he said De- Desi Hutchison uh, role with Watford 2022 versus 2023. So in 70 minutes of the 2022 game, the, he got five shots from play and scored five points. In 241 minutes of game time in 2023, he had five shots from play. So he had the same amount of shots over the whole league you could, uh, that he had in one game versus Limerick last year. So that was a sure sign that he had to get pushed in, you know, yeah. which is an amazing set, if you, if you ask me. But again, like he got he got back on form. I think, did he hit three? Would that be right? No. He got three, 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 three points. points. Yeah. Three points, yeah. yeah. Like, and look, they were. The wides were uncharacteristic. Um, who knows why? Because shit happens. <laughs> you know what I mean? A couple of wides. But it's good, good to see him back in there utilizing his pace. Um, I think for, for Watford to go forward, they have to have him in around the square. Whereby he's doing lateral runs across the line, occupying full back, full back lines because if they don't, like the Watford will struggle for an out ball, to be honest. Um, good to see Bennett getting back into a bit of a scoring, you know, a form again. Like he he had, he had a bit of a topsy turvy league, to be honest. So again, those two guys, like they're they're pivotal, and I think if Watford were to go anywhere, <clears throat> those two guys have to be hitting like four, five points from play each. And that that's just that's just what's required because other teams are doing that. Like if you hit, we talk about the Limerick, what's Glenn going to pop up with or, or, or Lynch, or whatever? The multiple guys who hit four or five points, so you need your big players putting in big performances. And it's good to see Jesse back uh, in, into good form in a position he should be in. Yeah, um, lots of questions about the referee and lots of arguments, uh, particularly on our YouTube live chat at the moment, uh, uh, about the refereeing and the way the Limerick are being refereed. But just you know, play with me here for a second. Let's just see if we can tease this out ever so slightly. Sure, um, correct. Yeah. Paul, <laughs> what did you make of the refereeing performance today? Because I mean, we were WhatsApping during the game because we were all watching the telly. And your first instinct was for Liam Gordon or whoever was out there refereeing the game. This wasn't an easy game to referee between Limerick and Waterford this afternoon. No, it wasn't. It, it reminded me straight away of the Munster final last year. Uh, and again, I always have to say with all these things, whatever your initial thought on the any incident is, that's also the referee's initial thought because he gets one look at it. He doesn't get a second look at it. And let's say, for example, you use Seamus Fanagan's one. When... Uh, Stephen Bennett took the shot and he was hooked by Peter Casey. I saw him being hooked by Peter Casey. Casey carried through. You looked, but your eyes followed the ball. Suddenly Bennett's on the ground. There's a few lads on the ground. I think Casey was on the ground. Flanagan was on the ground. I thought very much in that instant, for example, that Casey had caught Bennett going through and they fell and they hit the ground. It was only on the replay that I saw Flanagan got a clip yeah. on, got a shoulder onto him. Um, and I know a lot of people are saying now afterwards on Liam Gordon that you know, red card for Flanagan. I think Flanagan will get a ban after this. Like, he'll, he'll get, you know, retrospective. But in the moment, like, three or four players ran in through the middle of that. Very hard thing to watch. And the ball breaks another direction. 
So I was looking at it going, this is extremely tough for Liam Gordon. Um, you look at the likes of, look, Hegarty got his red card, you know, as in Hegarty gave him a, a bit of shit there in the first half and he, he gave him a yellow card, caught him then for the for the heavy tackle then. I can't remember which Waterford player it was. But then in fairness, even to him then, picked up that the selector kind of hit Hegarty a slap. Uh, you know, the linesman, whoever picked it up and, and gave him a red card. Like, he was doing his best in fairness. There was a few tackles then that, you know, he gave Barry Nash a yellow for the slap on Stephen Bennett. Again, you could see Barry Nash hands up straight away and Seth and Stephen Bennett shook hands afterwards. Some people were saying that maybe Barry Nash was lucky after that. Very, you know, marginal stuff, really marginal stuff there. But I think it was a tough game for Liam Gordon, you know, and I know mm. fans are passionate. The blood is up and it was a very intense, very passionate game. But, you know, you kind of have to step back, let the blood cool, look at it and go, if you were in the middle, would you have called, would you have been able to call them? I don't think I would have. I don't think I would have been able to call them as quickly or as easy. And for decisions that are marginal, you know, if they can go either way, you're never going to please anyone. You know, if, if, mm. if, if someone thinks, oh, Barry Nash could have been sent off, Barry Nash could have been sent off today because I know there was another foul in the second half in towards uh, Watford got a 21 yard free afterwards where he tripped up a lad you know potentially there maybe Barry Nash gets a second yellow because he fouled previously before that as well potentially but it's all marginal stuff it's not blatant stuff that the referee for me deserves people getting up on his back for him um, I thought it was I just thought look bottom line it's a very tough game to ref and I don't think I don't think he had a bad game and I know lads will jump, come out of the woodwork there saying Jesus, the shocking game because I've seen it already on Twitter. But I think it was a tough, tough game for him to, but, for him to ref. Like there were twenty-seven frees in the game, mm. and do you not think if 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 he refed like we see so many club games refed that he's blown for what everyone perceives to be a foul, that the crowd would go crazy for the opposite side. Yeah. So there was there was a lot of arms in stuff. A lot of what looked like to be pulling of the arms, pulling at the hurl. I get that. Like the frustration there. Both sides were doing it, so it wasn't one mm. one side was getting overly favoured from the other. You yeah. Know? So it's very it's very hard for him to see that in real time. I agree with you, Mark. Right. I think the game is so fast and physical that we do need some sort of assistance, not be, not the fourth official love, but someone like a bit like a, you know, a team on rugby where he can yeah. just go down to Liam and say, Liam, that's a red card for Seamus Flanagan. Yeah, we, we need a fellow sitting, over. A, sitting in a van outside with like just headphones on, not listening to the, the crowd, not listening to everything. And just exactly that, just going actually pressing the button saying, lads, I think we have something here you need to see. Because maybe then, like I think then that any gripes go out the window. Then, you, like you're never yeah. going to please everyone. You're never. Like, gonna... it's, not, it's, not, it's not that difficult to do because I know, mm. like Christy Connor was telling me before, like when he was doing stats for for Sky, they put him in a van, and mm. he just starts right and he stays there. Like so, it's not that difficult to get a person situated in, on the ground of some sort. You don't need a huge amount of technology. You don't yeah. need a huge amount of software or, or, or again a workload for or a team. You just need a couple of people. And, and sort of, and just it saves not an awful lot of hassle. And who knows the the impact or effect that could have had on the game if if Seamus just got a red card, you know, for yeah. instance. That again, I fully missed it as well. Mark. I completely missed it. And so when yeah. I saw the replay, I said, "Oh Jesus, that's that's a red if he if he gets caught." And I agree with you; it will be a retro, retrospective ban because it's in fairness, whether there's intent or not, it's deserving of a red. Yeah, so, deserving of a ban yeah. again. Yeah. Um, but again, I have to say that it's a hard game. Like I, I just think Harlan is so bloody hard to referee these days. I'd imagine. You yeah, know, because there's yeah. so many, you know, I won't say body parts, but the, the arms in is what I can't understand. I, I I look at some games and go, that's a free, and then it plays on. And then other games, I say, that's not a free, and it's free. I just don't know where they're going. The, the only obvious free I see anymore is, a, is either catch the ball three times or a chop. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's very yeah. hard for me to, to differentiate between what's, you know, what's free. You know? So I can't imagine what the referees are going through. And this is coming from lads who played the game on the ground, senior inter county at fast level. So we know that, like, Things happen, arms go in the left and center, and even we can't differentiate. It. No. You know, so it's, it's it's a thankless job. And look, look at if we're on the receiving end of a bad decision, we give out like shite. I do anyway. You know, <laughs> in the club. But as I said before, I'd never become a referee because it's it's difficult. And I think we have to. What would I say? Mind them to a certain degree. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But I won't say like oh, I won't say Malikadlam, them, but at least you know, don't fucking reprimand them for for what I thought is a difficult game for ref. What well, I actually thought as well, not to go to, sorry, yeah. Will, but no, no, I just thought they actually in GA Go, they interviewed Thomas Welch. Wasn't it Thomas Welch? Game, yeah. yeah. I thought that was actually very good, very refreshing. Mm -hmm. They kind of put a human element into it because you could just see, like, you know, he was talking that himself and the lads, he was really excited for the game. They drove up in the car. They were having a bit of a crack in the car. He said he went to his mother's house for the Friday this morning. Yeah, yeah. It kind of puts the human element because, like, lads, if you only see these lads week in, week out on a pitch, like, no more than the players. You forget they're somebody who's waking up tomorrow morning going into work. 
and you know all they want genuinely all they want to do is the best job they can and they want to be hopefully not talked about Monday morning meaning they probably did a good job but I thought that was actually really well done out of GA Go that they interviewed yeah. a referee I can't remember the last time I saw a referee interviewed you know no it's a new innovation yeah actually, I actually nice. really like it but I was just thinking it's funny even when you just look down through the reaction currently and the back and forth that's gone about the referee so you see Limerick 2018 saying he was whistle happy so much that there was 8 minutes etc in the second half um, which meant that maybe he was being too strict on certain things then you've got TV Street who uh, very humorously welcomed Owen Murphy to the conversation earlier on thanks as well. very much TV uh, Street the, man Difficult or a woman. match. I don't know. Or a woman, who knows? Difficult match to referee. <laughs> um, you've got Gary Farrell here. The referee was bad for both teams due to the pace, but Limerick could have had more red cards. Nash could and should have got a second yellow, and Flanagan was a dirty hit uh, that will be looked at afterwards. I, I think it will be. Um, I yeah. think there's a very good chance he gets a, I, I a retrospective a suspension. Go on. Uh, on the rules. So if, if, if Barry Nash got a black card, is that a red card after? If, he, if he's on a yellow and he gets a black, is that a red? Ooh. Got, good got man asking out. a tough asking a tough question on live shows, Kettle. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're not prepared for it because the black card hasn't been in for a good while. I'm trying to think. Now. The answers there. Somebody... I, I think it is because didn't um, didn't Caleb Lyons get one in Waterford versus Dublin? Did he pull down Donald Burke in the first match, and he was after getting the yellow already, so he got a red card after taking the black. Yeah. I think Which you're right. You, you, you accessed the mainframe there, didn't you? That's that's good. That's good knowledge right there. This is where the live comes in handy because it just doesn't look like when we're pre-recording, people can think that we're actually just pausing stuff. <laughs> no, we're definitely no. we're definitely not. So you've got no, no. me actually yeah. googling the rule book here. No, I'm fairly sure. Yeah. Caleb Lyons in the second half against Dublin in the first match, he had was on a yellow. He pulled down Donald Burke or Keen Boland for their penalty. And for the penalty, and he yeah. he was sent off. Yes, I think you're right. Okay, um, I'm on. Uh, the GA rulebook and it's taken far too long to find but this is probably what happens if you watch our uh, YouTube and you see either Scale or I reaching for the phone at some point to very quickly check something that's come up uh, so if there's any uh, would-be referees uh, definitely is yellow plus black equals red Kieran Harty thank you Kieran, man, Kieran. for confirming that uh, we are going to trust you 100% that you're right on that one um, so yeah look the debate's going back and forth on this one I, again I'm not 100% sure. I'm not sure, Scale, about this idea that some people are putting forward. That's like, oh, Limerick need to be refereed more harshly than they are right now. And that would have a huge impact. Like, I'm not sure there's a huge amount you could take from today that the referee saw and didn't deal with that actually had yeah, I agree. a difference on the result, if you know what I, I mean. I, I, sorry, I don't, I don't agree with the statement about the mm. referee being, or the Limerick have to be refereed harsher. I think the big instance were pulled. Now, obviously, the Seamus Flanagan was missed, but I think that was genuinely missed by everybody. I think anything that was actually captured, you know, was captured. You know, um, essentially, like they they do live on the edge. To be honest, you know, if you look at any team, like I guess Kenny and their palm too, they were on the edge. You know, and I and I know for a fact, like when we were going pretty good, we were told to go to the edge. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's the yeah. size. Of, like, like it it was it would have been said, let the referee pull you. You know, let the, let the linemen catch you, let the umpires catch you, but go to the absolute edge. And if you're met at the edge, keep going further. Do you know what I mean? That's just that was the reality of the time because you couldn't take a step back, and that's what Limerick play, To be honest, they're they're a big, physical, brutish team, and they're going to utilize that as their strength. And I, again, if I was over Limerick, I'd say do the same thing, and then it's up to other other teams to match that, and then the referees to keep it in the, in the rule book. It's that simple, you know. Like when there's instance, they need to be punished. Kyle Hayes is punished. Uh, who else got banned? Was it Hagerty got banned, or someone got a, a, Kyle when Hayes? Got got Will O'Donoghue who got banned? Respectfully, Will O'Donoghue got banned for the, for the Tipperary yeah. League game. Yeah, and it looks like Seamus Hannigan's going to get it. So they're getting, there is yeah. action being taken, you know. So they are going to be likely missing Seamus Hannigan for the clear game. Yeah. So, you know. There's uh, no update, by the way, for those who've been asking about the Declan Hannan injury. Uh, John Colley said afterwards he didn't have any news in the media scrum afterwards. So we'll right what do you reckon was? Yet. I, I don't know. I couldn't see limping. I couldn't see Anthony's hand. I was, I was wondering, I mean, he was sick in the league final. You'd wonder, I don't know, maybe not, but like, you know, he, had a, he had a very bad strike, Murph. Do you remember that before that? He, he, he had Brutal a one. Characteristic Straight strike. into Tide the Burkhan. It was, it was Watford's game. first shot of the game because he just, mm. he went yeah. down and it, as soon as he did it, I went, that's I, I, how long since I've seen a Limerick player do that? Just strike a, a bad ball down because Tide the Burkhan got it. And I was waiting to see at which stage was the first shot Watford would get from play. Uh, and I think it was nine minutes in, Tide the Burkhan took a shot. That was when Declan Hannon hit it. Was the and I was saying, Jesse he doesn't look right there, you know? No. Hmm. Uh, Philip Cosgrave, by the way, anti Limerick show. I would say listen back to Philip. any of Skell's uh, <laughs> conversations Philip. about Limerick during the week or during the year, I should say. Where uh, Jesus, you, you only know. have to go back to last week. 
Yeah, he's been accused of calling them the greatest team <laughs> of all time. So there you go. Um, we are absolutely against them. 100% agree hey. totally. Right, let's <laughs> let's switch across then. We can the talk. Yeah. Seamus Lennon yeah. and the whole number team should be thrown on the championship. For the <laughs> That'll be the only snippet now. That'll be yeah, as I was going to say, you know, you know someone's going to clip that uh, really badly now at this stage and go, you won't believe what that mad James Gettle lad said about Limerick. <laughs> he wants him kicked out of the championship. Um, Claire against Tipperary then. Uh, we joked earlier about Tipper back, but Tip scoring goals is definitely back. Uh, this has been such a trade of Liam Cal's sides. We talked about his Waterford team and how clinical they were in going for goals last year. Um, Paul, they scored 522 this afternoon. And even at the various times where Clare were able to fight back. And like Aidan McCarthy scores 113 today, which was a remarkable scoring tally at a time when Tipperary, I think, did a decent enough job of clogging up the space for Tony Kelly. Uh, but Aidan McCarthy was very much to the fore. Um, but every time Clare came back into it and got it back to four points or got back within five points, Tipperary were able to find another goal. 522 is outrageous scoring. Yeah, outrageous scoring. And it just goes back to... Lim- or Tipperary are really just co- so consistent each week at the moment in terms of what they're about. It's very simple what they're doing in terms of they're very clinical. You give them a sniff at the moment, there's no indecision. And that's just something that I, I just have to admire in this tip team that if you make a mistake, they'll punish you. And that's it. And I know that's a cliche sometimes, but tr- there was three mistakes, let's say, uh, in goal scoring opportunities for Tipperary today. Let's say the other two they kind of created and they punished him. And if you go back as far as Kilkenny playing Tip in Nolan Park when we were speaking about it, the one thing for me with Tipperary that day was their their thought patterns seemed to be very clear. You know, they were getting the ball, they were moving, popped the ball once they were in five or ten yards of space, run towards goal, over the bar, reset. It wasn't anything real technical. It wasn't anything crazy. It wasn't like that they were playing a mad tactic. And then through the rest of their games, this pattern followed where, you know, if they had an opportunity, they made a really good decision, worked the ball well and scored. And today, I think it's a lot of it as well. Not only were Tip in form for it, they started a, like you know at an electric pace, but Clare also fed into it. Clare made so many mistakes that if we're talking that Tipperary, our team, are going to punish you for making mistakes, it's also a reflection of how many mistakes Clare were making and coughing up possession and bad handling errors and leaving space open. You know, like Jake Morris, Jason Ford and these lads, they're looking for space at the moment. They're looking to create space. They're looking to exploit you. You have lads like Noel McGrath and these in the middle who are playmakers who who will look for that space also. And I think there's just an element of both. You know, Tipperary would be absolutely delighted today. Going up to Ennis, I mean, we said last week, this was flipping the coin stuff. Um, you know, Clare could come out, put in a really good performance and win. But just based on what we saw, the indications were the Tipperary would, would just about win. But we didn't think they'd rack up a score like this, which will be a concern. It's more of a concern, I think, for Clare than it is, you know, a fair reflection of... Uh, Tipperary scoring prowess at the moment. I think other teams, like even though if Tipperary were playing Galway here today, they weren't racking up five goals. You know, I don't think Galway would have coughed up. You know, funny enough, at the weekend we're saying that's in it after Galway coughing up two fairly handy goals. I don't think another team would have given them as much opportunity. So there's a bit to sift through there with Clare as well, and and what they're giving away to other teams at the moment. Because if you look at the two goals Mark Rogers got before half time, and you take away some of the tip, the Clare mistakes down at the other end, and Tip getting goals. You know, Clare, Clare are in a really strong position to go and win this match, but it was more their errors that just cost them on the day. But you have to give credit to Tip as well. Tip were really sharp. The amount of players that came on, I have them down for, I think, 10 scores here, 11 scores, lads coming off the bench. So, like, that's great. And Liam Cal will be delighted with that. Yeah, um, Patrick Hickey there, Clare supporter, was at the game today. It was in Ennis. Clare gifted tip goals. Clare's shooting was awful at times. That's one of the things that really comes back to haunt scale is that when you're coughing up the goals, I bring you the three in the first half, and then you take into account the 15 wides that Clare had across the game as well. Um, Clare had every chance of winning this game. Their defeat was self-inflicted to a large extent. Absolutely. Like, think back to the last championship game it was against the King last year in the semi-final. And do you remember when they were down? They kept shooting from just crazy angles. It was just monotonous shooting wide after wide after wide. Now, how long is it going wide? But it's absolutely energy sapping for you as a team and for the crowd. Yeah. You know, so I that's why I've, I've written here Tipperary full forward line, 411, Clare full forward line, 2 3. It's the important. Don't get me wrong, 411 is included some Jason Ford's freeze. I get that. But like a lot of the freeze are made from efforts. You could say that, uh, like the penalty, for example, freeze of efforts from people in the forward line. And it's just, I think Clare. For them to go forward, they've got absolutely electric people in Shannon Don, Aidan McCarthy, and Tony Kelly. Utilize those three guys the best they can. We didn't see ten, Tony Kelly at all. And we didn't see Shannon Don much in the second half. I thought he was very good in the first half. Use them more. And the second thing for me is 
get your full forward then going. You need to have retention people in there. Like Mark Rogers looks like a storm. Can go one to can go man to man. You could say utilize him more. See these shots. Some of these shots are crazy. Like, like there's only one or two people in the country I think that can that can regularly with a high efficiency rate shoot from let's say 70, 80 yards. Like Jimmy Burns is one. So it's, and it's hard to name another couple. Do you know what I mean? So like in, by the law of averages, I think Claire just need to focus on utilize the forwards more and it'll come, come good those goals won't go in every day though that's like they, they, they just won't you know what i mean they'll, they'll learn from that they won't let in five um but they were like jake morris gave you know, he gave joe hogan and hayes a, a third time you know an absolute third time so that just shows the benefit of having someone who can utilize the ball take on defenses and occupy so much because if your full forward line is going well then they the full back line is screaming for assistance for the halfback line so they're pulling everything back and just sp- space opens up and like i already mentioned for no mcgrath who I'm a big fan of him. He's, he's, he's turned 34 this year and putting a, a performance at midfield in today's game the way he did. Excellent. Mm. Uh, let's talk about defensive performances then. And Scale, get your notebook ready because I'm going to do the Mikey Butler mention this week, not Paul. Um, <laughs> this is the best performance we've seen on Tony Kelly since Mikey Butler. And it came from yeah. Carl Barrett today. And um, Porrick Bowden says, Carl Barrett, most underrated hurler in the country. Tony Kelly didn't get involved today. Um, so give us the defensive breakdown here, Murph, from what happened. Uh, why did Carl Barrett, uh, or how was he able to actually stop Tony Kelly from having his usual influence today? I just think very similar, like you said, to that person that plays cornerback from Kilkenny that I won't mention because Skettle will, will hop all over me. But it's okay, look, I mentioned him, so work away. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, I mean, I think they've just followed the template of Mikey Butler, just, you know, stick on him. And if if, if Carl Barrett, and Carl Barrett did hold the ball in his hands and came out with a few balls today. But you marking that down, Skettle, that I marked that. Yeah, Did you're on two, four, oh, six, eight, ten, ten, ten times, of, thirteen times. Of <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I mean, I mean, Barrett just stuck to him. And in fairness, Carl Barrett, you know, he he doesn't mind staying in that role if he doesn't hold the ball, let's say for a whole half, fine. And then if a ball or two breaks, he'll break out to it, pop off a hand pass, and he's happy enough. That's his job. So yeah, it was interesting. Like you know, we saw a great point from Kelly in the second half, but that was really it. I mean, he had no influence on the game, and I think teams are just looking at Tony Kelly now that. It's very much a case. And I think until Clare actually have a definite plan for Tony Kelly in terms of how they're going to get him on the ball. Like I think very much we see Tony Kelly over the last few years being his own kind of genius in terms of getting on the ball, creating his own chances. I think Clare have to look at it from the point of view of how do we create chances for Tony Kelly. Do you know? Mm. I mean, we saw him in the first half there. He ran into a cul-de-sac because I think he felt he hadn't been in the game for 10 or 15 minutes. Clare had given away a few goals and now Tony Kelly felt I have to go and do something incredible here score a goal when a point was on and he would have been in the game then he kind of forced the issue whereas you know I'm looking at Clare going how you should be facilitating this man come into the game um, whatever whatever that looks like and uh, get him closer to goal potentially more in 11 position like you know he was out around the middle of the field today and Carl Barrett was following him so I'd be looking at Clare going well, how do we get this man into the game and like it's funny you know Scale obviously mentioned you know, the likes of O'Donnell and these lads and like the really the, the great players they have at the moment. Like three other lads who are top quality forwards here, the likes of Aaron Shanahan, Peter Duggan, Ian Galvin, like, you know, like they have serious firepower there. And like th- players who play different styles of hurling, like Peter Duggan, you go back as far as 2017, was it? When they played Yi in the semi-final, would that have been right? Skettle mm-hmm. in, in Crow Park. Peter Duggan had an incredible yeah. game. Yeah. 80. Yeah, do you know? Yeah. Electric, incredible hurler. So, like, Claire have all the components there. But the big thing I'd be looking at is, like, Tony Kelly, like I said, over the last few years, it's very much been a Royal Rover stuff where he kind of is landing on ball himself, creating it himself, running all over the place, enormous, enormous athleticism. But I think Claire, if you look at it now and go, okay, Tony Kelly is racking up what they're having down for today, a point. One Tony point, Kelly, yeah. One point in a game. Lads, if we create opportunities that this fella can run onto doesn't matter who's marking him then because we've created the platform for him to take over the ball as opposed to him going you think you go back as far as the match last year against was it against Limerick uh, where he caught a ball landed on his back got up and scored a point you know he'll do that that was a monster finally it was like a tortoise in that game Pop yeah he was on, he's on the flat of his back like you know mm. so he was like a tortoise. tortoise. It's an of, animal. It's in the shell and then he jumped of these, up. In the Galapagos, there's these animals called tortoises. You know? Listen, I know it's on these, right? <laughs> Bless the lip now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like a what? <laughs> but you know, so that's just where I see it at the moment. Like realistically, player need to figure out they have a big kind of a question mark there over Tony Kelly in terms of how do we get him into the game? If they get him into the game, it'd be 10 points for worth but, of, of a player do, for Claire. I think now, say, with Mikey Butler <clears throat> and Kyle Barris, like they've done the man-marking job. So Tony Kelly, when he when he goes well, he finds himself in pockets of space. 
moving between positions where someone's not necessarily man marking him. He's going yeah. between lines, you could say. So if he's being man marked, would not put him into a position like a, a centre forward or a full forward type role and just feed the ball to him and he'd make it work. Yeah. Then, yeah. then you're 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 like letting him you're getting him the ball. Because I fully agree with you, Murph. Everything he does is magic. It's it's self it's self creation. And yeah. it's, it's it's ridiculous stuff because he has to go and carry out this ridiculous stuff to get the ball, you know. Yeah. And like yeah. if he if he doesn't go well, Claire don't go well. Trust me, because when he goes well, Claire go very well. But when when he goes well, it's usually like you said, ride the rover stuff. But if he can go well yeah. in a more structured, orthodox kind of setup, yeah, whereby he's being fed the ball, big yeah. difference. Big yeah. difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't disagree with Martin Furlong about the job that Damien Reck did on Tony Kelly last year. But if you're going to argue it's the best performance on Tony Kelly since Damien Reck, you're writing off Mikey Butler. Do that at your peril in front of Paul Murphy, I would say. <laughs> um, Reck did a good game. No, and in fairness, Reck was a massive miss uh, for Wexford in the weekend mm. uh, just come by, especially when it looked like he was going to start. Lee Chin was missing as well. Um, the damage done to my fancy team by late withdrawals this week was just untold. I think the average that's been done in our group is about 150 to 160 points. I think I'm sitting on 74 or something from the weekend just gone by. So it's all gone horrifically wrong uh, with some of the injuries that were picked up along the way. Uh, David Fitzgerald's uh, drive from midfield was a massive loss as well. Uh, Patrick as well from Claire uh, saying that, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. The, the suspension came back to hurt him quite a bit. Mm. Um, his influence with his scoring scale and with the amount of ball he gets on in the middle of the field, he was a big miss today, wasn't he? Yeah, but he's an all-time midfielder. Mm. Like, if you take someone out of that quality over any team, like, it's going to set you back a bit. Um, and I think today, the way the game was 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 played, there was an awful, an awful lot of shots taken. Like, And he's shooting from midfield is probably the bar Tony Kelly is probably the best of all, you know? So he's, he's a huge loss. But again, it's a, it's a plus. He's coming back next week. Uh, or this weekend coming, should I say, for for the Limerick game, and they're going to need him, like because they're, like they they, as we said, if they go out of the first two games w- with zero points, tricky proposition, let's you know, a tricky proposition to try to get out of that group. So, um, they need everyone, they need everyone fit, everyone ready to rock for for a big game of the weekend. But yeah, David for sure sorely missed. I presume you can both guess who the last team Tipperary were to beat in Championship. Twenty months ago, it happened, July twenty twenty one. July twenty twenty one, last team to bet in Championship. Uh... Jesus. Claire. Claire, correct. So they bookended their championship wins either side by beating Claire. So that, that obviously was, it was six six games beaten, wasn't it? And this is yeah. their yeah, yeah, yeah. So psychologically, Paul, how important is this win for Tipperary? Um, you know, Tip fans yeah. will always say Tip are back. I'm not sure if they're hundred percent back just yet, but psychologically when it comes to the rest of this um group stage in Munster, how important was getting today's win? Because you both said last week you kind of fancy Tipperary to win against Clare, but going to Ennis is incredibly difficult to do so. And now they've started off with this win. How important is the win psychologically, Paul? Uh I think it's a big one. Like I think tomorrow morning I've experienced these kind of wins. Like they definitely would have targeted this match as soon as they were finished with the league and they finished with Limerick. Um this was the match they were targeting. And you can guarantee, like, you know, the tip players would have been enjoying look coming into this match, going, Do you know what? You know, we're really refreshed. We know what we're about. We've been hurling really well. And you know, you can tell that the tip players are enjoying what they're doing, even the games in the league, because it's it's hard not to when you know when you know what you're about on a pitch. That's one of the most enjoyable things <laughs> for a player because you get the most <clears throat> out of your, your team, whether you're winning or losing, you get the most out of your team. But they would have targeted this game and tomorrow morning they're waking up with it. No, they will week off this this is their week off now this week and they get to go and watch Waterford and Cork in Parky Cueve next weekend they have a great win over Clare mm-hmm. and their next game then is the Saturday the 6th of May against Cork so like Cork are looking at the Waterford game now going right we want to get a good start against a serious Waterford team who actually put up a p- battle against somebody they don't know what they're going to get out of that Waterford team but they're going to get a battle and Tipperary get to sit back now look on and go we're going to pick through this Cork performance and see where we can exploit it. So I think where Tipperary are at the moment are going, brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant start. And like these are only things that you can kind of figure out week to week as this Munster Championship plays out. Because, you know, you can look at teams' gap weeks. You can look at the, the, the order in which they have their matches. But until they play those matches and have wins and losses, it's hard to read into them a whole lot. But like Tipper would be delighted tonight going home. Liam Cal will have played a lot of players. A lot of players got scores. A lot of players hurled really well. A lot of players got game time. There's so many positives. When a hard match, or one, one against Clare in Ennis, you know, racked up a big score. Tomorrow morning, they'll be buzzing to get back to work. Tomorrow night, recovery, Tuesday night, whatever it's going to be. Knowing that we're going to have a nice bit of training now this week. We'll get to have, you know, train Saturday probably, watch the Cork match, back into training, 
and go at Cork then the following week. Like I think Tip are really happy after this and really, really happy. And I think the Tip fans have been really happy as well because they have something that they can grasp now going, we could potentially go to a Munster final here. You know, if we turn over Cork, suddenly Tip are in pole position now to go at a Munster final with Limerick. And, and Tip won't fear playing Limerick if they do get there. If we you know if we talk down the road, Tip won't fear that. So is this being the first building block? I think Tipperary are absolutely delighted tonight. Yeah, I mean, in all scale, five championship debutants, uh, Brian McGrath coming in alongside his brothers today, Johnny mm-hmm. Ryan, uh, Brian O'Mara, Alan Tynan, Garrod O'Connor, players who played well in the league and have been rewarded for that league form by a start today by Liam Cal. And yeah. that's a good injection of new blood into the team too. And what I thought was quite interesting, I was listening to Nash on Thursday night and off the ball, and he was asked about the Liam Cal effect. And he said that Brian O'Mara, who he had coached in third level for the Fitzgibbon for the last couple of years. He said that Brian O'Mara went to America last year because he was waiting for Liam Cal to come back and become the Tipperary manager. It's a bold statement, isn't it? It is, but I presume he's not saying it out of nowhere. I presume that conversation must have happened. Absolutely. Um, Just when when Paul was talking, like he was saying about how the Tipperary people are waking up, I just think managing a team are like, a win like this after coming back off a disappointing championship last year, it really, it galvanizes the group because first of all, yeah, the players believe what the management are about. So everything they're being told, every, the way they're being coached, the way they're being trained, etc. Now the players fully buy into it. They believe it. You know what I mean? And the, like I was the management, the managers didn't believe in the players that they're giving debuts to, bringing on. Like Stakeham did well, like Humanic, Ryan, O. You know, lads that they're getting some minutes into in, a, in an intense environment. So that that the two points is great. But at the back of it all, I say when you go to a difficult venue, uh, effectively a new team, both on the pitch and on the sideline. And you come away with a result that big against a seasoned team who are on in year four of their of their journey, if you want to call it, that is absolutely huge. Like that is huge for them to go forward. And I think this this not, not only the two points, but this is going to bring them up an extra couple of levels. I think truthfully, I think and they go down to Cork, heading to Parky Cueve into a venue they think that they can win. And so if they come away yeah. with the first two rounds and having two home games in with Limerick and Waterford, she's like they're they're I, I agree with you more. They're looking at this going, yeah. Let's let's head let's head for Munster final. Let's see let's see where, where this takes us, you know? Yeah. Um and like just as it put up there, this win in us would be the maker of the tip team. I fully I, I believe it. You know, it's it, it galvanizes them everything and it's more it's more than more than two points. And like is Bonner I just question, is he injured or was he on the so today? Don't don't James. get me started on this match say twenty six. Um I can find it here now. Um and Shame Cameron's I, injured. I think, I think we, I think Liam Cal was listening to Skell and his American football. He named an American football panel. Uh, I love Bonner. Bonner, Bonner Mara was wearing TJ. Was it TJ or what's the one saying JJ Watt sixty six on his back or whatever it is. Ninety nine. Uh, come on. Ninety nine. Uh, must be looking at that upside down. <laughs> I, I kind of like the Jason Ford 007 and all that. Uh, Brian Mara, I know. thought he should have gone the whole way. Maybe it's a rule. Have the keeper as well with fucking seventeen on his back. Uh, Bonner Mara was on was on the bench wearing eleven. Ah, right. But he was number eleven based on his alphabetical order, with the exception yeah. of as people have probably gathered, because I stuck up the fact his alphabetical order on Friday when it came out, and people were like, well, except Barry, Ho- Barry Hogan clearly isn't. And you're like, well, look, they've clearly done one in sixteen. They to, respected as, the keeper's jerseys, yeah. Maybe it's yeah. Really wrong. Plenty, plenty of respect for that. But um, seeing Mikey Breen pop up in positions in number four, seeing Jason Ford in seven, I don't know. Like I saw the program today, and I don't think that's Tipperary's fault that the program was printed out with just eff- effectively. I'm looking at the where you normally have the team lined out, and just the 26 are just there, and great mm. surprise. You're doing like, what look, you will. <laughs> yeah, they, well, they've got it, around. It, they've got around the scale. I don't know. If, do, do you really care? I mean, again, people in the comments, did you really care the Tipperary? I just didn't name a team. From. Didn't name subs. Who cares? I don't give a shit. I, I, I don't really care. And do you know what? Again, uh, Liam Cal addressed it. You know, before the match, he said, "Look at, um, you know, we were asked to supply a team which we weren't comfortable with because we hadn't, um, we hadn't told our own team yet. And there's a few variables which I understand. Like, you know, you might have injuries, you might have whatever. Do you put out a dummy team? Do you not put out a team? Whatever." And he just wasn't comfortable with it. And that's what he said. And he said, look, hopefully in future we'll be able to actually, you know, not have to do this. Um, but like I wasn't too fussed with it. Look, again, it's it's I know traditionalists and people like to see, you know, so you can maybe enjoy the look into the game to see the matchups and all these different things. But even if a player is wearing 15 on his back, he could go out and play centre forward. Like so it's mm. it's 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 harder this day and age to actually read into it anyway. But you know, in fairness to Liam Cal, he was asked a question before the game uh, on GA Go, and he just said, Look at uh, this is 
this is what the way we approached it. We weren't comfortable, but hopefully the next day we won't have to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, Joe Butler raising the point. Guys, what do you think of the numbering of the jerseys for Tipperary players? It's a bit disrespectful <laughs> to neutral spectators. I, I think it does suck if you go and buy a programme and you pick the programme yeah. up like we saw today that has 1 to 26 just laid across the pitch as really? opposed to having a team. But I just, I looked at a lot of teams that come in. My focus was on the football because what I was doing on the radio earlier today, a lot of the football teams that were named had four to five changes on them. So you got to bring the pen for the changes one way or another uh, mm. when it comes to these programmes. Like they're just all over the place. Uh, Patrick also saying, Cal is the players now and the talent will believe that they can win and bring an end to Limerick's run just like in 2010 versus Kilkenny. Maybe is that the key, Skell, that you've got this Tipperary team? Maybe they're the only ones to stop five in a row. Hmm. <laughs> Easy on that side, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> we said they go forward. Let's, let's target the Munster final first, yeah. Um, yeah. Stop a Limerick is, 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 is going to be a tricky proposition. And I think what you said last week, I think Murphy ran about beating them once is one thing and beating them twice is an entirely different proposition. So mm. uh, that, 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 we'd be watching that with, uh, with interested eyes when they meet down in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Turles in a few weeks. Um, look, I, I, I stand by what I said a minute ago. Like It'll be the making of them together. I, I agree with you. Um, but to a point, like they have to keep growing and growing, and if they if they keep going on a similar trajectory, producing good performances like they did today, you know who knows where to take them. You know, so you get like firstly today was a courageous performance for them. They build confidence in it, and if you if you have a team who knows what they're about and they have momentum and confidence together, that's a dangerous tandem. You know, so mm. like, and if they if they get knocked back theoretically, you know, in in a couple of weeks' time, can they bounce back again? You know, because that's that's. That's what it's all about. Like, I, I, I don't think I think it's a bit premature to say that they can they can take down Limerick. Have the potential? Absolutely, they have the potential to do it. Will they do it? Is a different thing entirely. What about Clare, Paul? This weekend, it already feels the eight ball was used in Davy Fitzgerald's interview. He said they're behind the eight ball because of what happened today. Is there a kick in Clare, given how well they played against Limerick last year when they go to the Gaelic rounds this Saturday night? Uh, it's a tough proposition for Clare the next match with Limerick. Like, as in, I don't think, uh, to be honest, I think Limerick go and beat Clare as well from the point of view that I think John Kiley's comments are reflective of the way he's thinking at the moment in that he is keeping his eye on Limerick not or turning up to a game maybe stagnant. Like, today you have to put, you have to also say that Limerick weren't where Limerick usually are. Like, you know, they were off that pace a small bit. I think John Kiley is very aware of that. And I think the, the comments he was referencing to, and I know I'm going a long way around answering McClare here, but I think what he was referencing to, to there was that people may be saying that this team is going to win five in a row, and not just five in a row, six in a row, seven in a row. And he's con- concerned about his own team hearing that. So now Limerick are focusing on this resetting against Clare this weekend. Clare are coming from a different point of view, going, we coughed up five goals, which we weren't expecting to do, against Tipperary. Mm-hmm. Try and identify the pl- problems <clears throat> and not present those same opportunities to a Limerick team that may punish you even if you don't make any mistakes. So I think the proposition's a lot different. Again, you have to look at it as well. I mean, I know a lot of Clare fans will say, we go back to the Munster final last year, and you know there was a pocket of ball in it, and John Kiley said that as well. Go back to the last time Limerick and Clare played, you know, it was one of the, it was a very poor match. I'm not saying one of the worst matches I saw, but it was such a dead match. You know, you, you, as long as Clare don't turn up with that. Now, I know there was no Tony Kelly that night and so on, but you just, Clare need to put in a savage performance just to get the show back on the road now. That's all it is. And they have ample time. They have ample time to do it. But, you know, a, a really good performance against Limerick will do a lot for it. And, you know, just doing a lot of the basic things well that maybe they didn't do against Tipperary today, that'll go a long way towards getting the show back on the road. But, I think they'd rather have a different match. I think they'd rather play somebody else than play Limerick this weekend because I do think that the fact that Limerick got a bit of a warning off Watford today and Watford highlighted them for in, in, in parts, outworking them in parts, I think that'll have a knock-on effect to the clear game and Limerick will look to re-establish themselves in the game as being the hardest workers, moving the ball really well and rattling the back of the net a few times. Because I think they'll look at Clare today saying, lads, if we don't get goals against Clare, well... <coughs> Tipperary are doing something better in their full forward line than we're doing. So I think Limerick will take that as a fence and Clare are going to have to deal with that. So it, it, it's going to be a very tough challenge for them. They have the players. Like we said, they absolutely have the players individually. But what are Clare about at the moment as a team? What is their plan? Are they going to bring Tony Kelly into the game that bit more? Are more players going to support them around the pitch? You know, there's a few things there to, to ask, but it's, it, it's certainly a tough challenge for Clare this weekend. Right, Skell, how are they going to get on? 
I, I, can, I, I read whatever Tomorrow says. Um, ah, stop Shannon. doing this. This happened twice last week. It's at least four <laughs> times now. Because I definitely heard you saying earlier on, I'd have to agree with Murph there. That's not how this Yeah, it's, it's, it's not even against my better judgment. It's just, <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> We're sitting off the same hymn sheet for now. For now. This for could now. all change when, when we meet, when, when next week comes along for our own, our own counties. But um, it's a difficult proposition to go down to Limerick. I think Limerick will come away from today's game, obviously happy with the two points, but there's 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 a lot of work-ons, you could say. Um, I'd say John Kiley, I'd say if he was disappointed, to, if you can call it that, after the league final with their shooting efficiency, he might be a bit more disappointed with the way things went today. They're obviously going to be missing... Uh, Hegarty's back, sorry, because he was two yellows. They'll be missing Flanagan. Um, I'd say this week, a bit of a bite, a bite to it all. Um, but again, I, I just see I, I see Limerick winning it, to be honest. I see a winning home crowd <clears throat> getting the show back on the road, I think probably four or five points, to be honest. You know, and, and from the goals perspective, I just, as, as you were talking more, I was thinking... If you're Brian Lohan, do you change your keeper? I think you probably do, not to be harsh, but like realistically, look, you're playing at the top level here. Like, you know, if teams have bad performances, you know, you have to you have to maybe give another player a chance to show that, you know, actually you don't, you wouldn't make them decisions. Because a lot of it was decision making, you know, a lot of it was taking the wrong decision. And you know, it's it's not to be hard on Eamon Foodie, like, you know, it's not to be hard on him, but mm. like we, me and you have been in those positions before where we've made bad decisions, we were punished for them, and then you don't start the next game, or yeah. you know, you have it's just the reality of it, like you know. So, I think, I think Eva Quilligan is sitting there going, If I don't start the next day, I'll be really disappointed, you know. Uh, and yeah, I think his I case for that would be is that he doesn't make too many bad decisions, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, he's he's solid. I, I, I agree with you, like, I, 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 I think he's actually underrated as a keeper, to be honest. And I think mm. if you put, if you push. Um, if you don't change your keeper and he goes out next week against Limerick and like Limerick are very very difficult on opposition book outs they, they do a great setup. this could be a tough one for him I think you actually do you save him from himself to a certain degree like Quilligan I don't know is, it, is the form bad I said to you if it was a major tactical change where someone was, was critical to the structure or the game plan fair enough but maybe Quilligan's form is poor at the moment you who knows you had him last mm-hmm. summer as one of your favourite goalkeepers you were picking yeah, Nash yeah. as number one but you said he was right up there as one of the best in the country who was the pick at number one? You picked Quaid. Sorry, Jesus, why am I saying that? You picked Quaid as your number one. I mean, you are yeah. Quaid fan number one, let's be fair. But you yeah. were like, Claire have got an outstanding goalkeeper here as well. And now we see a different... They do, yeah. You were asking yeah. me who's underrated. And I said, Quilligan's underrated. Um, but see, what happens is some goal, some goalkeepers build up money in the bank. I'll put that right here, right? So then when they make an error, it's kind of just passed off. You know, so like yeah. Nikki has Nikki has so much money in the bank now that if he makes three horrors like that was meant today... Still, it's still okay, you know. Yeah. So, whereas Quilligan made an error against Tipperary a couple of years ago in in Limerick was it a Munster final? No, it wasn't Munster final. Munster semi final, or even Ron Romney, I'm not sure. But he uh, made an error, got bet by the near post by I think Shane Flanagan goal, and that seems to have stuck with him for some reason, you know. Whereas I think he's built up enough of a reputation in my my view to be a consistent number one. Like puck outs is good. Like against Kenny last year, when when there wasn't too many performances to 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 say it were positive for Clare, you'd have to say that. Sean O'Donnell and Eva Quilligan both played well. You know, so I, that's why I was quite surprised to see the change coming. And you can kind of see it coming too with the way the league was going. But I'd say if you ask people in clear themselves who was going to be number one, they, were, they would have all said Quilligan. So I'm surprised that he, he, he watched in goals. And I do, truth to speaking, this is dog eat dog stuff. If Clare loses again this weekend, which is a, there's a probability of it too, they're under pressure. So you have to go out, you have to go out and bring your best 15. And for me, he's, he's one of them. Paul, I stuck this up on screen because I saw this question come in earlier on. I said, oh, wait, we got through the two Munster games before I bring it up. Do either of you lads have a game that everything went wrong for them and they somehow still pulled off the win? Yeah, um, oh, definitely. There's definitely a few games where not to say everything went wrong, but you did loads of things wrong. And I, I can't even tell you the year, but I remember we played Dublin in Nolan Park. And like this is just flashed into my head now once I saw the question. We played Dublin in Nolan Park in the league. Um I'll go as far as say 2014, maybe I'd say around then. It could even be 13. And I think we scored five goals, and I think Dublin could have scored six. It was an enormous scoring Ooh. game, but there was goals everywhere, and it was all handling errors. It was literally during the game where now we won in the end. I'm fairly sure. Yeah, we we won, but handling errors, lads dropping balls, lads falling over balls. It was during a p- period where you were doing heavy gym work, heavy running, <laughs> going out to an early league match at the weekend, just part and parcel of it. And it was just one of those days. It was raining a bit. Dublin were up for it. Dublin were a big physical team. Lads were dropping balls. And we still came away with the win. And it's kind of a funny one because you come away from it going, I don't know, am I happy that we actually won that match or should we have lost it? And it actually it was gas because I was living with two lads at the time. 
and uh, we used to have membership. Kilkenny would have membership for Hotel Kilkenny, where we used to use the gym before the gym in Nona Park and all this. And we, the following day, I went across and was in the sauna with the two lads I lived with, and there was two or three old lads inside in the sauna, and they were caught in the back of every Kilkenny player. And sure, I could feel this coming. Sure, they had they didn't even know who I was or anything like that, but they were giving out about me. And sure, the two boys I was living with were loving this. And they were there going, and that fucking Paul Murphy, Jesus Christ, he was dropping balls. I'd like, I don't know what Cody sees in him at times, you know? And I was there laughing because I thought this was hilarious. But what was so good was the boys moved on from the conversation, moved up to the forward line, and the two lads I was living with dragged the conversation back to the full back line. And why, why, why was Paul Murphy back? What was wrong with him? Like, you know, what was he doing? So, like, we've had, I've had games like that, definitely. Now, it's tougher when if they come in championship. I can't remember one in championship where everything went wrong. We still won. They're rare enough. Usually, if you do everything wrong, yeah. you're going to lose the match. But I don't know, Skell, do you remember again? What what a scoreline, just before you come in, Skell. 5 16 to 6 12. It was 2012 National Hurling League at Nolan Park. The Dubs score 6 12 and lose. Yeah. Bonkers. Six anyway, goals, sorry, Skell. Mean. Your uh, moment of adversity or game of adversity, you still won. I don't you see you can get you can get the feeling in game this isn't going right. And the harder you try as a group, then yeah. the worse it seems mm-hmm. to get. Now, I've had a couple in the club where I say where we've we've you know we've we've pulled it off and say, but in county wise, I nothing comes to memory. I, I always think of the 2018 Leinster final in Crow Parkworth. Mm. And I was thinking everything we did that day was was was, was poor. Like so it just we couldn't get our rhythm going, couldn't get it whatever going was it down to us, Don Kenny, whatever. And we, we were lucky to come away with a draw. Oh, we went to Turles and you, but yeah, yeah, we came we'll, back at you in that game and just got a draw, wasn't it? Yeah. Look at come away with a draw. Like I, I just thought like um you know, that, that that kind of game, you can fucking feel it. This isn't going right. And you try, pickups are being missed, you know, like sh- shots are going wide that you think they, they go over handy. And it's it's very hard to kind of stop the rot. You know what I mean? Where experienced teams are able to do that. And luckily at the time, we didn't get picked that time. Um, but no, in, inter-county, I agree with... No, I'm not going to say it. Murph, I was going to say I agree with Murph. <laughs> <laughs> We're allowed to say it. Stop. I think Murph has, Murph has a we'll... point, right? If this happens in, in championship, right? Yeah, you're going to get bet. So I don't yeah. think it happens too often. What's that question? River Power. Yeah, I like this goal. question. That's why I stuck it up. Yeah, it's good. Because you can talk about this. What, what does a goalkeeper do? Because I think for goalkeepers, sometimes it's a lonely thing. You know, if you've made a mistake, you get highlighted an awful lot more than the rest of the team. And yeah, therefore... Yeah, though, will you see? Yeah. Like if but what do you do on the week after making a couple of mistakes? So like, if, well, let's say now, if that was me now, if I, if I was following the goals this week, I wouldn't look at the game at all today. Tomorrow morning, I would just look at the goals Analyze what I could do better, uh, and then move on. Just move on. You know what I mean? I wouldn't even focus on the goals this week. I would focus on getting, you know, the mind sharp again, sharpness, and just keep keep things rocking. You know what I mean? Um, because the worst thing you can do is just keep thinking about those goals, rerun the work. What the fuck are you laughing at, Murph? I'm laughing at someone put in a comment. Jesus, Paul, do you want water with your orange? <laughs> <laughs> so should be very familiar with is my wadi um, at this stage. I think uh, Skell and I are both on. Black <laughs> I wasn't laughing. Like I know, the, the Jeez, you're very insecure, stuff. aren't you? You're talking about goalkeepers being confident. And you're well, hold on a second now. I was talking about this poor young fella, right, who was going through a bad time. You're there wetting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it, was it's a it was a great comment. It was a great comment. <laughs> the big this Give me the number of the two boys you were living with no, there, and we start to chat about you. No, I tell you, in fairness, uh, I will say you know, I agree with Skell there. Obviously, I, not to be highlighting this agreeing with each other. No, but like the thing is about it, like it's it's very tough, right? Look, you're at inter county level if you're for for aim and foodie. Like, I mean, you're at inter county level. You make mistakes, it's going to be highlighted. You just have to accept that. And let's go. What do you do? How do you bounce back from it? Like when I had, let's say, my day that was for, like, let's say, Eamon Foodie's day today, where he didn't have a good day. It's not like it's no panic. Like there's no one, there's no one dead. He'll go on the next day, and he's obviously was picked because he's been doing really well in training. He just has to remember that that, you know, what the performance may be the few mistakes I made today. I'm in the goal. When I make mistakes, they're punished. Corn Ford makes mistakes. A lad just comes out with the ball. In 2010, 2009, I started midfield for Kilkenny against Dublin. I was flying it in training. And I ended up marking Alan McCrabb that day inside Nolan Park. He ended up winning an all-star that year. But I came out completely flat. Didn't hurl well at all. I think I poked one ball. And I was dropped from Kilkenny for that year. And, like, the Damn. learning curve for me there, 2009, yeah. The learning curve for me there was that um, I just basically went, like, that's not me. That's not the player I am. Like, my opportunity was given to me. I didn't take it. Right, I'm going back at this again. And I think Eamon yeah, Foodie will just go, look, that's not the player I am. I made two mistakes. I got punished, two or three mistakes. I got punished. This is championship hurling. You can expect that. Go back into training. And like as a goalkeeping, you know, 
let's say, squad or cell or whatever you want to call him, himself and Eva Quilligan, the lads, will go at it and say, look, it, that's just the joys of it. When we reset and we go at it again and we have a bit of competition. But, like, it's just the nature of it. I, I hate to say it, but, like, a goalkeeper and a full back line, you make mistakes, you're punished. And you, you think mm-hmm. it's the centre of the world and you think, oh, you know, you never recover from that. You will, you know, you will. And it's just the nature of it. And you know what? You come back stronger from it, if anything. If you take it on board and come back, you'll come back stronger from it. Yeah, sure. It's character building, isn't it? Completely, completely, like, yeah. you need it. like people always say, oh, he has to get his confidence back up. Confidence comes in a while, but he has to be courageous now. Yeah. He has to go after this week and accept that what happened happened today and move on and, and yeah. keep 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 the courage, keep going after it and just focus yeah. on the first ball. If he's picked, focus on the first ball and start even. And what, you, what you'll also find as well, not to jump across you, what you'll also find is that you'll never have criticism from a fellow who's actually stood in the same position as you. Like, I mean, if any lad is saying something stupid about Eamon Foley over the weekend or tomorrow morning or whatever, I guarantee that fellow never stood in his position and actually stood between the sticks for Clare or for Tipperary or Galway or Kenny or anyone. He never stood in that. You'll never get criticism from someone, like undue, unfair criticism from someone who stood in your boots and made the mistakes you made. Yeah, um, I love the way people, there's like a chance, now that we're live on the Hurling Pod this week, um, so join us on YouTube if we decide to do more lives during the uh, year. In fairness, there's a good lively debate going on at the moment, so I think this might well be something we do again. Um, James Coughlin, or James Collin, depending where he's from, but I, I'll guess Coughlin, uh, asked Gell, was Fitzy a tactical genius today? And I think around that as well, Patrick Coleman had come in and said, please ask Gell, will Davy get more out of Waterford, or is this the Davy bounce? So, Why are you asking me? Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm very wary that at this point we're about 18, 90 minutes away from the Sunday game starting, and I believe you've put hours of work into an NFL draft as well. So I'm wondering, will this be a 20 minute answer if I ask you what you made of Davy and if this is a Davy bounce or you were actually impressed by what Davy did today? How do you rate Davy's tactical performance on the line for Waterford against Limerick today? Well, I think you have to give credit where, where, where it's due, like you know. So we just mentioned about the shot count from Limerick. We mentioned what they've scored. So they've kept them to the least amount they scored in their 17 on beaten runs. So there's credit for that. They didn't win the game, but again, they weren't expected to win against, against like nearly a juggernaut. So they, they, set, they set up and developed a game plan to neutralise Limerick first of all and then try to get them on the counter and run a game. And it worked. And like a lot of the, lot of the scores they got in the first half were frees, frees that were developed through running, running at them. So that, that's, that's, first of all, got them, get them into the position for fitness and second of all, then develop a game plan. Didn't work, fair enough. The proof was going to be in the pudding at the end of the, the monster round robin to see is it, it like did did all the tactics work as a whole, you know? So because Skeha loves Davy. What oh, Jesus Paddy Paddy Corn. Ah, on. look, he's <laughs> out, he's having the crack in fairness. <laughs> I know. Uh, Skell, what are you saying now? Munster on top, Rotter Watch, Paint Dry, the Leinster, all Munster games should be broadcast and forget about Leinster till Kilkenny versus Galway. Fine. Hold on now, Danny, for a second. And this brings us nicely around to Leinster. We won the games of the weekend was at Corrigan Park this weekend, where Antrim were ahead for 67 minutes of the game. Dublin strike over two points. Then Antrim go back and you think this is going to be the moment that they've actually let it slip and maybe Dublin are getting both points and they look back at this and say, oh, and then Antrim go back in front and then Keno Sullivan hits a really late point to get an mm. equaliser and the team share the spoils and it leaves mm. actually that last place in Leinster feeling wide open. Um, I know obviously <clears> after <throat> the hammering that Westmead took against Kilkenny, the feeling with the Westmead are going to finish bottom, but Antrim and Dublin are now both within a shout scale of qualifying and even if it was on GA Go and not national TV, it might not be the same standard as some of the stuff that we saw in Munster today, but we got a really entertaining game between Dublin and Antrim on Saturday afternoon. Jeez, we did. Like, I know. Prop the, can you prop the comment again? Can you? <laughs> yeah, oh, there's some more. Here we go. Scale or Murph, sorry. Uh, no, that's that's hurling one, two, three, four. We'll come back to that. Uh, this is a moment where the chat has moved too quickly, um, but okay. I believe it was, I'd rather watch paint dry than Lentz Ura. Danny's here. There you go. Danny, how, uh, Scale, what are you saying now? Munster on top. Rotter watch paint dry the Leinster. All Munster games should be broadcast. Forget about Leinster till a Kilkenny versus Galway. Okay, what I'm, okay. First of all, what am I saying? Uh, first of all, we never we never actually said Murph or any of us that that the, the Leinster Championship was a better championship than Munster. You know, we all kind of said Munster is a great championship. It's fabulous. You know, it produces some great games, but that just don't be thrown shade as much as people do with the Leinster. So obviously, mm-hmm. what, what happens is people compare. They compare both provinces, and fair enough. There, it's just the way it is. There's more quality in Munster at the moment than there is in Leinster. But like, I, guess, I think it's, it's slightly disrespectful. When you look at the Antrim Dublin game, th- that was a savage game. Do you know what I mean? And like Rapture's Cowards, they always say, well, look at the venues, Galway, Wexford, damp, dr- 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 dirty day in Pierce Stadium, Kinney hammering against Westmeath. So look at it wasn't a, an overly, overly exciting weekend for Leinster. But I wouldn't fucking shit all over it. <laughs> like, I'm mm-hmm. down there watching paint dry. Do you ever watch paint dry? It takes an age. 
But like, I, I, ultimately, like, you're going to get these cracking games uh, in, in in Leinster too. So like, rather than you know, pissing them, just uh, look for them with anticipation. Yeah, hmm. I, I I'd say as well. I mean, I heard earlier today before the game, Joe Malai and Tommy were just talking about you know there's articles going up there. I think Michael Foley wrote an article as well, just about the entertainment is gone out of hurling. Like this is obviously a big talking point at the moment, but like that. And from Dublin game, the first thing you think of is entertainment. Like, if you think about today, Watford and Limerick, it was really entertaining. Like, I mean, what's entertainment? Like, where it's it's controversial, where there's a lot happening. There's a lot of instinctive hurling. A lot of people are saying that, obviously, you know, the, the tactics and things were dominating. But I think if, if we saw anything from Limerick and Watford, from Antrim and Dublin, you know, it was instinctive hurling. Um, and it was even you now clear and Tipperary, yeah. Like I mean, at times it, it it showed flares and flickers of really entertaining hurling. But you know, just going touching back to what Joe and Tommy were saying, we're like, you know, maybe is it kind of a bit stale and different things, and the entertainment is gone. I think we saw it there that like I mean, Antrim and Dublin. If you were looking for entertainment, that's that was a very entertaining game. And like I know people might pull through it and say, oh yeah, Limerick this or you know, Clare would beat them or Tipperary beat whatever entertainment if that's what you're looking for that was a great game yeah um so both teams are in a interesting position scale after that game because we spoke about it last week this was important for dublin because dublin now have got west mead next where they would be expected to win at parnell park on saturday <coughs> antrim got a tricky trip to go against wexford but may well view that as a bit of a free hit because antrim will expect to pick up points when they play against west mead in a couple of rounds time so therefore, Dublin, because we already spoke about how difficult it's going to be maybe moving to Crow Park for that game against Wexford particularly. Um, I don't know. I think pressure's on Dublin now going into this weekend after not picking up the two points in Corrigan Park at the weekend. I, I agree with you. I think like Dublin, I think the players and management alike would have looked at this game in Antrim and said, no, I wouldn't say take it for granted, but they would have expected to, to come away with two points. Like they, I think there was, was there seven or eight points margin was in the league and the two of them which that were very, very and to went to a strong team in that league game mm-hmm. and Dublin kind of went with a, a makeshift team to, to a degree. So th- you would have thought they'd go up and get two points and the fact that they don't now puts them in a trickier spot. Like we were saying that, you know, Wexford would get through, you know, just, let's say, ahead of Dublin and whatnot. But now the gap seems to have extended a little bit more. I know Wexford is zero points, don't get me wrong. But yeah. like, you, you think Wexford with Antrim coming to them that they should take two points there, you know, especially with, with big names returning back. So it's pressure, like, and it's a good situation, I think, for, for Antrim. If I just go over them for a second. I know you mentioned it's like a free hit, but like, Jesus, there's nothing to lose now. Like, they, they, they will look at this and go, right, we sh- we will, at a minimum, you would say we'll have three points. I think they'll beat Westmead. Uh, if we come away at five, this is, you know, it's an audacious attempt. <laughs> you know what I mean? If they can somehow get, get two points over Wexford, however unlikely that, that may be. But, um, yeah, a great start. Dublin are under pressure. I don't I don't think they have the squad, you know, to 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 really, really trouble, you know, I suppose the championships this year. And I, I we did say from the off though that, that this was going to be a building year for them because there's been such a, a personnel turnaround. So it was a disappointing start for them. But look at they show great reserve to get out. You know, Antrim were up, so they, they, they battled back and came out of the draw. So they, at least they came out of something. There's positives in every situation. Yeah, um, Joe Butler. The only notable thing in Nolan Park yesterday was TJ had a penalty saved. Uh, that was an incredible um, save, by the way. Noel Connolly got right across and saved it because there were a couple of penalties that weren't great this weekend. Like Conor McDonald's penalty was not good for Wexford, and I think even Galan would be a bit disappointed with the way that he hit the penalty today. Conor McDonald's penalty list. Oh, yeah, not good. <laughs> <laughs> he took one in the Leinster, Leinster the, 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 the final in 2017, and it was his bad. <laughs> I mean, how was Rory Connor hitting them? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you wonder. I'd say Ian was shot. If Chin, <laughs> if was, Chin was, but if Chin was on the pitch, Chin would have hit them. Like Chin was just such a big loss. And I so don't get it though. How was Chin togged out? Helmet on, warming up. You know, if you're in the twenty six, let's say that way. Why aren't you on the pitch? A man of his quality. Oh, presume he got a knock though. Maybe him and Rec weren't as close to fitness as the kind of we thought they were. Or maybe no, I know Rec. I think Rec did Rec go down yesterday in the warm up. I think so. I think he picked up something very yeah, late. It was a very late goal, withdrawal. One of the goal were saying that he he went down the one off this this arm. Um, mm. I didn't when I asked about Chin, they didn't didn't notice an awful lot, to be honest. So strange mm. one. Credit to uh, to Condi for the save in the TJ. But Joe's point here that the notable thing was TJ had a penalty saved, he missed a free from about thirty meters and had a long range free short. Um is that a case, Murph, if TJ's come back in? This is the first game he's played since the All Ireland Club final. He's had an extended break and probably gonna take a bit of time to maybe find his feet and he had like we didn't have to have the debate because Kilkenny have now 
held Billy back for the 20s as opposed to both of them having to share the pitch of the weekend? Yeah, well, Billy Drennan actually was in a boot um, since the... Uh, since the Galway match the week before, uh, he was going down the line yesterday in a boot on crutches. So I think he seems to pick up a knock in the Galway match uh, in the under twenty game. So it's he was. I know how bad the magic boot is because we've seen Katie McCabe, Evan Ferguson go into the moon boot and then be back yeah. out the next week. Or is this suspected to be a bit worse than that? Well, Kilkenny played Dublin yesterday in the under twenties before the Limerick game. He wasn't togged either. Like you know, so if they're holding him for something, like I mean. You know, Kilkenny had a tough battle against Dublin as well in the under 20s. So it's kind of a case that it's 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 a dangerous game if you're being very conservative and holding them that way. Um, he seems to have picked up a knock. In fairness to him, um, it, yeah, look, maybe in one way, like you don't obviously you don't want an injury on Billy Drennan, but like it gave a chance for TJ to slot in, and there was no distraction of you know who's taking the freeze. Look against Westmead, I don't think there would have been much of a distraction anyway. Westmead were missing five players as well. I mean, Joe Fortune said it after the game. Like this game, in fairness, uh, I can't remember who made the comment there, but like this game didn't get going. Um, it was one way of traffic. Uh, Kilkenny were very much in third gear. Like the penalty, penalty was struck well, but there was a lot of rain before the game as well. Like you'd see a lot of players were slipping and sliding. Um, Kieran Doyle had three frees that he dropped into on Murphy's hand from fairly scorable positions. So when you see brother, when you see Kieran Dyle in that you know. His brother Killian was injured, which just made such yeah. a difference. And I think um, totted it up after the game. So the three forwards who were missing for Westmead, Killian Doyle, Niall Mitchell, and also Niall O'Brien. And I'm not sure how long Niall O'Brien is going to be out for. Niall Mitchell had knee surgery recently enough, so I think he's going to be out for a while yet. One fifteen they scored against Kilkenny last year in the fixture in Mullingar. So that was a lot of firepower to take out of the team and Kilkenny East a victory, 29 points to 7. Maybe the good thing for Westmead was they didn't concede a goal, but they're injury-ridden going into that game against Dublin this coming Saturday evening. So that's a huge one for them. Um, also, when we look at the weekend just gone by, Skell, what do you make about Galway? And this is broad, broad strokes here on the game at the weekend because, again, this could have been like the Clare situation where they conceded two goals that you would have been very disappointed with. But I mm-hmm. felt in the second half, Galway wrestled control of the game and we're probably worthy enough winners in the end. Yeah, I go along with that. Um, I think someone dropped a note to me there today that, that it was six points in the margin, but it felt like a hammer. It, it, felt, it did feel like the distance was 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 larger when you're watching it in real time than what that final score scoreline suggested. Um, I was I wasn't worried. You could say watching the game, I was just I was more concerned with the way we were playing uh, for future games because we. It reminded me a bit of the Limerick League game whereby we were hitting an awful lot of fifty fifty balls into our full forward line, like not really hitting balls to space. And it was kind of worrisome because if that's the way we're going forward, like when you get to the bigger teams, they'll lap this up, especially if you play it like we can even go Nolan Park and start hitting in 50 50 balls in the top of a defense that loves the aerial ball. Not going to you, not going to work. Then in the second half, we opened up a bit more. Um, like case in point, I'm talking about Liam Collins got a point in the second half whereby he did a run, checked it, and went back another way. And he found himself in 20 30 square yards of space. Like if we can utilize our forwards more that way, I, I'd be a lot happier because, like, how, how many times do you see Connor Whelan? He's always wrestling with a lad, trying to get the ball. Do you know what I mean? There's always a lad above in his back, or does? Do you know what I mean? It's just he has to go through a terrible amount of workload to get to get a ball. So how can we release these guys into 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 space? How can we get Brian Cannon in space? Cahill, Connor, do you know? And it'll it'll I suppose it'll start to flow a bit better. Tower defence, bar the two goals, obviously there are two terrible goals. You know we we know that ourselves. Um, however, after that it kind of showed up. Mac was good. So, you know, he got plenty of trouble off Conor McDonald, I'll give you that. And Dahi was yeah. good. So ultimately our half back line was a very was a good launching pad. I do think with Finton Burke being back, he'll have to go in at wing back. And I think we have to put Joseph Cooney up. I know Joseph is a good defender, yeah. good forward, but I just think we have to have to get him up there. Um, because we need if we're going to hit in this 50-50 ball and we're going to, you know, persist with it to a certain degree, we need someone like him in his aerial ability. So because in the half back line is not being utilized the way the game has been played a lot of the time now. You know, so it's it's the ball is either bypassing or going in front of him. So we need to get him up there and uh, use that big paw. But look, ultimately, two points, good start. On to next week. Great return of Evan Island as well. Uh, Thirteen points. Uh, yeah. I think it was a six of them came from play during the game. He had a, a sixty-five five freeze and oh. sideline, I think, as well. But like he is obviously there as a dead ball expert as part of the team. But that's a really really good return from. Him. Yeah, and I'm sick because I was doing my fancy team on Friday evening. And I didn't. I, I didn't press save changes. Everyone was in my team, and I had him captain. 
<laughs> and I was like, I was so happy after the game. I said, this is brilliant. And then they put up your pro- pro- provisional scores today. I went in and I was like, oh my God, he's not on the fucking team. <laughs> <But> anyway, <laughs> look, he's, he's, he, he does this for Claren Bridge too. Like it's well within his capability because his skill set is very high. So he's very good in tight, tight, tight areas getting the ball. Not quite King Lynch standard, but he's, and like he's, he's good at getting the ball and fending it for himself. So, mm-hmm. and he's, he's an absolutely deadly the, the sh- shooting expert. So good. And, and, I'm delighted to see it for him, for himself, because he's, he's like he's a hard worker, <laughs> sound fella. But I'm delighted for Galway as well that we have another forward who can execute like he has, and we have another scoring forward, and, and it's currently you know, with progress. So again, don't settle on that. Onwards and upwards, and uh, back it up this weekend. Yeah, um, Murph. Again, the wait goes on for Wexford for a win in championship against Galway. We noted last week, '96 All Ireland semi final was the last time they beat them in championship, and you know the period that probably killed them during the game was 26 to 35 minutes they scored one point yeah, at a stage when they actually were a little bit on top against Galway they allowed Galway again to reel off a run of scores and this has happened before it happened in the Walsh Cup final slash first league game earlier this year remember we were talking about the fact they ran off I think it was 10 points without response yeah. Yeah. Um, that's just going to kill you in a game if you go through a 9-10 minute spell without a score yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And even you think they, they put that together with Galway coming out of the traps in the second half and really going at them again. You know, they had a great platform. And I think they kind of they fed off of nearly being surprised when they got the two goals. And suddenly they had, I think it was a five point lead at that stage because I think Galway, Galway could have got the first point, but suddenly a five point lead. And it kind of sprung Wexford into life because I didn't expect Wexford to have a bit of a spring in their step in this game. But, you know, again, those things we spoke about it last week here that. Um, in, in the game down alone in Wexford Park that they let Galway score 10 scores in a row I think it was and we said they wouldn't let them do that again they nearly very much did in this game um, they just about broke it up but again in the second half like Galway just kicked on and, and Wexford didn't do anything to try and stem the tide what I thought was interesting from both sides at times and it's something definitely Galway will look at to improve on is a lot of aimless balls struck down into half back lines where there was one lad standing on his own. Like how many times did Dio Keith come out with the ball yesterday? And like uncharacteristically from a few players, like you know, Park Mannion came out with the ball yesterday, had a look up, um, soloed it a few times, or maybe it could have been Cahill Mannion, I think it was Parik though. And 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 he, yeah, he looked, no one was there, thrown it on the hurl, and then just poked it off the hurl down the line. And dear man O'Keefe, and there was nobody around him. So there was and I think there was a there was a period there of like two or three minutes for both sides. It was like tennis, where they were striking the ball back and forth. Both sides would be unhappy with that, but I think particularly Henry would be looking at that going, you know, we've spoken about most likely carrying that ball up through that middle area, getting it into good positions, and then the likes of Evan Nyland, Connor Whelan, Connor Cooney, these lads coming through and putting the ball over the bar. But for periods, they didn't do that. I think Henry would be looking at that going, well, let's wait and see what can Kenny bring. But most likely, you can guarantee Kenny will try and do that. So I think... The match next weekend is going to be telling for both Kilkenny and Galway, but particularly Galway, if they're put under pressure, will they strike that aimless ball for Richie Reid to go drifting onto? Because it's 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 not a good platform for a team in this day and age if that's the type of ball you're going to pump down into an open half back line. Yeah, um, Martin Furlong there, Chin's shoulder was injured during the week, Rec was injured during the warm-up. Both are expected back next week, though not certain, according to Darry Egan. So, big boost if they get them both back over the week coming. Um, Cork waiting in the long grass. That's one, that's one scale. Where are Cork at? Um, because last week we kind of talked about it a little bit, and there were some people, particularly Clare supporters, like you've not justified why you think Cork should be in second place, and you both pick Cork in second. What are you expecting when Cork take the field this weekend out of this Cork team who've now had a little bit of extra time after the league to get ready for this first championship game for them? Um, I'm expecting a victory first and foremost. Um, I think that they. they I, th- I feel like they're going to build on what they did in the league. Like again, when, when any team exits the championship, or exits the competition, like they, they always, you know, it's it's, it's negative surround, surrounding that kind of result, etc. But I thought Cork had a really promising league, like putting, you know, putting a couple of teams away in in, in fact fashion with with their scoring. Like so, they've always had good hurlers, you know, um, across the board. And I think someone questioned me on their defence, like, and I think the yeah. Cork's concession rate was was. Was not huge to say in the league. Let's say it was, I think there was, I think they conceded 126 points, which was like tied for for second or third. So it's not it's like it's not a, as if they're getting opened up left, right, and centre. I just think they're they're primed to build like because they, they they do have the hurdles. And I, I go to town against anyone on that one. They do have the hurdles. It's just the, the question is, can they always just fit it together? And that's that's the the big cloud over them for me is, you know, 
can they put the talent, the skill, can they put the fitness, all that piece together, grand, but can they put it in an aggressive manner for 70 minutes against a team that's going to come at them hard? You know, that's all I, I, I'm wondering about Cork. And I think, they, I think they can. I think they're looking at this year and looking to build. And good, good, good place to start off in Porky Queen with a home crowd against a team that's, that's coming off a loss and missing a player or two. So I'm expecting a victory. Um, will they finish second? You know, I, I'm going to stand by what I said last week. And wait for another couple of weeks to unfold to see where that where that happens because the Tipperary game is going to be huge. After that one, then we we'll know we we'll know what they're going. But yeah, look, I think Cork are they're not to be uh, long grass is one thing, not, not that long now. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I think they'll be expected. So that, again, as I said, we're in a good league, so it's not it's not like they're coming from nowhere. Mm. Um, uh, so yeah, let's let's see. I have I have a question in currently uh, with the Sunday game to find out if football or hurling is first because I'm sure there are many people in the stream who want to go and watch uh, the Sunday game in a few minutes' time. Um, but there's a question for you, Skell, before I ask you where this draft is at because this might become the bonus pod um, between you and I at some point. Uh, best penalty taker the Skell has ever faced coming from Thomas Hayes in Facebook. Ooh, TJ was very good. You couldn't read TJ. See, certain penalty takers when they stand over the ball you, you can know by the way they're shaping he's going to go to X side or Y side but when TJ was over the ball I couldn't tell was he going left or right you know I couldn't tell and then just when he when he picks it where, wherever way he shapes his body I'm like okay he's going to my left and next thing he shoots it to my <laughs> shoots it to my right you know very very difficult to face um, Gillan was good TJ was good but it, in in terms of back in the old rule you could say Canning was ridiculous you know, Canning has just an absolute whopper of a shot that you do well to uh, you do well to stop, and then the one time I remember we played a, a interprovincial game, uh, and Angie Nash was, it was 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 the opposite goalie for Munster, and it was the time the the rule was still in play that you could you know he was doing the doing the big pickup, and he, he carried in like seven or eight yards and then wallop it. I'll never forget thinking, Jesus, this lad is going to absolutely wallop this ball, and he hit it. I'm not joking, lads. The power that went into that shot, right? <laughs> and I didn't, I just, I just like this, the horror, I, just, I didn't even see it, right? And thanks, the grace of God, it went over the bear. But in terms of absolute power, like, oh, frightening. Was well, right. Stephen O'Keefe a madman for running down a Nash free? No, not madman, no, no. But Jesus, I, I saw, like, the imprint of the O'Neills was on yeah. his leg for about a month afterwards. Yeah, but sure. Look, t- like, think back, like, the goalies didn't wear helmets for, for years. Do you know what mm. I mean? When I think back, and I look back at pictures of, of all my underage games. 10s, 12s, no helmets. No. I, I bet what? I bet when they first put a face guard on your helmet and goals, you were like, it's blocking my vision. I'd prefer I not hate to wear it. it. Anyway. I absolutely hate it. And now that I see, again, I only, so we started wearing helmets. Helmets became legal uh, in 2009. So yeah. my, my first couple of years ago, there was no helmets. And uh, that was the time when look, man, when we had the fucking baseball machines. You remember the Oaks? <laughs> Do you know what? Yeah. Tell, tell the baseball machine because there's enough people still here oh. that are obviously interested in listening to you guys talking for you to tell this story. Because this got told at the roadshow and unfortunately because you said you were drinking it ended up getting cut from the eventual video that went up. So Sorry. you turn up for training. Was Callan, was Callan on the panel as well? Was it you and Callan? We turn up for training. Callum, Callum and I are there for training yeah. and it's in Pierce Stadium and there's these baseball machines and I hear <laughs> Sorry, here, like it's there Sean Tracy and Louis McQueen putting these balls and they're absolutely flying out of this machine so sean and louis said right we'll do some uh short practice on you with these things and call them again no helmets lads and no cups that's the bigger thing no cups there was no cups for for the crown jewels right so Colin was there and he's right right sean you know ready when you are and then sean goes call him the ball is behind you he looked around he, the ball, he, he put the ball in the machine and had gone straight past him didn't even see it like like i didn't leave him don't you know Michael's brother Mm. He, he were training in in Athenry one day, and he got hit, I think, in the leg or somewhere, with with, with the ball from the machine. And when he he rolled out, and when he came back to recover, he got hit again. <laughs> he, said, <"Well>, he, <laughs> that. he just said, "Fuck this, I'm out of here." <laughs> like, there's but, a certain uh, Happy Gilmore quality. Is that how Happy Gilmore used to get ready for hockey season? Is he used to go out and get the baseballs hit straight at his chest, and it was meant to hardy him up. Like I I don't know how Lucknan thought that this was actually going to improve anything. He was going to injure his goalkeepers. Nothing else. Like. It's it was the kind of situation where you had to you had to get psych, mentally psych yourself up for this, that this I could potentially potentially lose an eye here, <laughs> you know, in the next five seconds, <laughs> and you were kind of positioning yourself in such a way that you didn't get the midsection because if that was the midsection, oh Jesus Christ, that's you know I'd still be crawling, you know, it was like it was just it was lunacy <laughs> to be honest, and they're probably in some lad's shed now somewhere, never used again. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think it was a uh, much vaunted difference maker for the Galway panel is what it was going to be. Um, Pierce Murray is warning as well. Will there be a bonus pod this week? Uh, I don't know because obviously this um, live idea was slightly different. I have this great idea of uh, Skell doing the Father Ted being the bonus episode, um, which may well still happen. I'm still trying to work out what to actually do if with I, that because I don't want to get us banned. If I sat here, right, and I called every single county a bunch of wankers, right, I wouldn't get as much of you as I've gotten about not watching Father Ted. <laughs> I mean, like, I just want to know, what did you do every Monday night when you were a teenager? Like, I mean, it was yeah. on Mondays. It was like Father Ted, Friends. Remember that Don't Feed the Gondolas? There's a well, I'll tell you class what, right? we passed. Uh, we're all roughly the same age. Everyone talked about this in school, scale. So how did you yeah. avoid all that? I, I, we had Sky, right? Uh, when I when we when it first came out, it was out, on Channel I mean, Four. Channel Four was on Sky hey, as well. Give me a second. It's on RT. Yeah. <laughs> so even the, like I just I was always watching shit on Sky Sport. I don't know. I, I just never got into it. And like I didn't think he was going to be part of our our, our society or our, our our identity as a nation that I have to watch this brother did Like I think Skell turned it on one day. And thought it was a reality show. It was just too close to home for him. And he's like, this is this is down in Capitagular. What's the story? <laughs> Sorry, over the road. Is this Big Brother or something or what is it? <laughs> I did like technically. I think uh, Craggy Island was you leave Galway, you go west until you see the English tankers dropping off the nuclear waste and then <laughs> the, the, eventually the island will appear, I believe is its official location. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing this. It's going to be glorious. Uh, Sunday game starting with football. Great news. Uh, oh, it's, I'm going to tip and clear here on the telly and say it anyway. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, at least Murph has it there in the background. Okay, we will wrap up then because there's a few uh, bits yeah. and pieces that have come in that we'll just finish up on here. Um, Gary, Jerry Gavin, I should say, on the Facebook. Paul, who oh. wins, Kilkenny or Galway? Kilkenny. Oh. Well, Scale obviously doesn't agree with this. I know. So what, Kilkenny. Why, uh, why are Kilkenny going to beat Galway? <clears throat> ah, why are Kilkenny going to beat Galway? That's a good question. Like, just looking at it from the weekend, I think if Galway come uh, and are anyway flat footed in the way that they played against Wexford, I think Kenny will capitalise on that. Again, you, you always, in these situations, when okay, I know we went to a tip to beat Clare this week, but indications were there that tip were playing very clinically. This is a tight one for both sides. I'm kind of giving a small bit of uh, tip here to Kenny, the fact that it's in Nolan Park as well. Um, but I just think at the moment, you know, Galway, will they threaten towards goal? Hard to know that, you know... I don't know where the goal threat necessarily is at the moment. They certainly have it. And if Conor Whelan ticks and supplies a few balls, they do have a goal threat. But I just, my gut is just telling me at the moment um, that I think, I think Kilkenny will just, will just pip this one. Like, you know, they've tried a lot of players. Very hard to nail out the Kilkenny 15 at the moment, which I think Derek, in fairness, is playing it very clever. You know, as in he's picking, he's cutting his clock to measure. So I just have a feeling over this one that I'm, I'm happy where Kilkenny are coming into this game. But look, it's a very tight game. It's a very, very tight game. Um, and a draw here would really cause a bit of consternation for both sides. Like both sides are going for a win here to set out their stall, and in the view that both sides are going to meet each other in the Leinster final again, not writing off anyone else. But that's that's the attitude towards this game. So there's a mental battle to be won here in this game. Never mind two points. There's a mental victory to be won here as well. Yeah, I mean this feels big, scale, even at this early stage. Like even if we are to expect that these are the two teams who will go through and who will play in the final, going to Nolan Park. Sunday afternoon, two o'clock. It's Sheffield versus Ling, not Sheffield versus Cody this time. So that side story's off entirely. But this feels like there's a real big game feel about this on weekend number two. Yeah, and I, it's it's. I, I, yeah, I know. I suppose it's probably the comfort of Leinster, if you want to call it that. But I think both teams will look at this and say, right, this is going to be our Leinster final pair. Honest, honest. Mm-hmm. As a Gory man, I say, and Murph as well as Kingman, I think both of us would, would agree that we we feel that Kingman are going to meet the Leinster final. So if you look at look at last year, Galway put in a really good performance in Pierce Stadium. Um, I know TJ went off injured that day, came out with a victory. It was a really feel good factor. I think that didn't turn us over in, in the Leicester final with a good, with good performance. So I think Galway go down to Northern Park. The confidence is not, is not really I, I wouldn't say confidence like of, of a victory, but they're, they're going down expecting to win. You have to go into these games expecting to win. And like Northern Park is a, is a lovely surface there a couple of weeks ago. It's a real hurling pitch, and the crowd are a real hurling crowd. And this will be 50 on 15. Go at it. There'll be no there won't be, you know, excess amount of systems here. I just think it'll be 15 and 15. Both groups are fit. Um, I don't think there's anyone injured across the board, as far as I'm aware of, I say. I think the matchups are going to be really exciting. Like, I'm looking forward to seeing the likes of Dahi on TJ or Mac on TJ. I want to see who picks up Adrian Mullen and Owen Cody, etc. So there's a lot of dangers for both teams. Like, both two good sets of forwards coming in a, a bit of form off, off the backs of two victories. Uh, no goal scored by either team, which is interesting. Um, and mm-hmm. so it could be 
effectively a bit of a shootout. Um, so shootout from from points perspective. Um, I, I again, I'm I'm back in Galway as a Galway person. I'm saying it's it's, it's probably the the, the minimum minimum margin. To be honest, I think it's only going to be a point or two. It could be even be a draw. I to a certain like there is a, a strong possibility of that too. Um, so yeah, look at it's fucking doggy dog here. The situation as in down to Northern Park. You should be itching to get that. Mm. itching to get it. I'm sort of half excited here thinking about it. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have to piss off either of you, which is great news. I can just say, have a good time this weekend. I enjoyed it <laughs> Sunday. Um, it seems to be a very, very strong feeling, by the way, that people are enjoying the live aspect of this. So this is something we probably will do a few times. I mean, it's not going to be possible every week, but during Championship, I do like the vibe of it's just coming off the back of games. Uh, Seamus Hughes said it does feel big. It'll have a final S type of deal. I think Galway know it's now or never for them. And Jack, you were saying hurling a football divide is annoying. LOL. I have no hurling or football divide this this weekend at all because awfully one in both codes so i can enjoy the football <laughs> and the hurling um the football will probably make the sunday game at some point um mm-hmm. but awfully hurlers top of the joe mcdonough cup as things stand uh own cal 112 um i know you're a big fan scale um yeah. particularly since he's gone out the field he's now averaging 15 points a game uh got 15 at the weekend awfully 14 points to one seven up against down eventually won 126 to 115 uh johnny kelly their manager said to us after the game that like they're just wrecked they need a break uh so the week is required for them after playing eight weeks in a row uh the drama was all in the game at netwatch cullen park as it's called for sponsorship reason now uh carlo 112 or sorry carlo 122 leash 122 uh was the full-time result it looked like leash had won the game very late on a uh, picky morris took over two frees and then ender roland put over a long range free uh between the 67 seventh and 70th minutes it looked like the narrative was going to be the leash were back they had won two games in a row they were strongly placed to still reach the final and then marty kavanagh again the second top scorer in the joe mcdonough so far he bangs in a penalty with the last puck of the game effectively 122 apiece and now leash require favors from their neighbors off mm-hmm. if they're going to qualify for the final and kerry kind of saw off a dogged enough kildare side in the end in hawkfield kildare now the disappointing for them thing for them is they got to the division two a league final and they're now pretty much out of contention to reach the mcdonough cup final a uh, six point win for kerry in the end the goal came very late on from jordan conway who come on as a sub but kerry were three up at half time then paul dolan was sent off for kildare mm-hmm. so they played for nearly 20 minutes a man short and kerry just eked out the result uh, the game's in two weeks time so there is a break in the mcdonough cup this coming week so on may the 6th you've got offley against kerry I think on the Sunday, the matches are going to be Leash against Kildare and Down versus Carlo. So that's still very much up in the air uh, with Carlo and Kerry just behind Offley in the table. So uh, very difficult to see how the John McDonough is going to finish out. Um, as I say, if people have enjoyed the live aspect of this, by all means, leave us a like on the YouTube particularly. Uh, stick a comment in there outside the live chat saying, hey, do more lives. And uh, I think we can do this definitely in a while. Um, Murph is, uh, I believe, preoccupied tomorrow. So Scale, you and I might well talk at some point about this draft because I feel bad not putting this in but I realise we could be here for another hour and a half if we actually do it now. <laughs> how, how many rounds of the draft have you done already? So I, I had to pick my... I did three rounds of 11, right? So I picked yep. the Lee McCarthy teams, the Leinster and Munster, Munster Championships. Uh, so that's 33 players. Mother of God trying to pick 33 players. And then what really got me, what really fucked me up, right, was when I picked a player, right? Then is he... So let's say, pick number one for Westmead is Keane Lynch. I'm like, right. Does that mean Limerick lose Keane Lynch? And this is this I started around my head. <laughs> You know what I mean? I'm like, Fuck. So I got, I got, I got, I picked her to three leads, and then my wife saw the list, and then she mentioned three leads, and I'm saying, "Fuck it, <laughs> I need to put them in somewhere." So I, I want to apologise to your wife again for getting her name wrong on the radio on Thursday when we were having a bit of crack, but there you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> so anyway, you oh, you oh. you didn't do what I thought you were going to do, which was what I would do if this draft was going to happen to make it a bit easier for you. Every team has to surrender all of their players. And everyone goes out into an open pool like as if they're drafting out of college. And therefore, Westmead can select Keen Lynch number one. Uh, number two can be, I don't know, Gerald Hegarty goes to Antrim. I know, but then I started, so like in, in American football, here's my American football. I know, I know, the, but you've got to overthink this. In the draft, they all pick, you know, not necessarily the best player, but they pick from position they need, right? So yeah. I started thinking, right, who needs what here? So not, not necessarily, <laughs> we picked five top players, but my five top players in the country aren't the first five picks. You know what I mean? Okay. Because I was thinking, right, uh, yeah. Westmead yeah. could do a key lynch. And then I, then I actually See. picked Nicky Quaid at eight, at seven. You know, It's a good idea from Owen Hurley, by the way. But look at how much work that would be. You draft out of the Fitzgibbon. So you can have any players in Fitzgibbon right now. So I need a month. Brian, Brian O'Mara could be your number one pick overall. <laughs> yeah, I need a month, lads. <laughs> or Mikey <laughs> Kiley. There's lots of options. Yeah, I don't know. Jesus, lads. 
Yeah. I think it's, but I've, I've 10 Limerick lads, 5 Kikini lads, 2 Tip, 2 Clare, 2 Cork, 5 Galway, 3 Watts for 2 Wexford, 2 Double. It took me an age. <laughs> Joke. It's, right, next week. It's, next week, it's worth the bonus week. pod in and of itself, Skell. How is it about we agree to that? Sure. I, I can't sure. do the Father thing, Father Ted thing yet. It's hard to say one after another because I have to work out if we get dropped off YouTube for uh, sticking up. Because what I want to do is I want to have Father Ted there so people can watch the episode and watch you responding to it in real time. But my worry is if I put that up, somebody somewhere will uh, put in a copyright strike against the account and then, you know, Off The Ball's YouTube is fairly important to the company. I test for the end. <laughs> uh, <laughs> imagine that. Or, it's reasonably or, fundamental. Or, I don't be the one who goes, well, you know what? I had this bonus pod idea with Scal that we'd watch Father Ted. I'm <laughs> um, sorry that we're, you know, down for 30 days, but, uh, you know, good luck. Yeah, where's so, the house, actually? It's supposed to be close by somewhere. It's in Clare or something. It's in Clare, I think. It's in Clare, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's out in the burn there, somewhere in Clare, yeah. Well, if you yeah, like fans, we were there, we, we, I was there, yeah. I was there years and years ago. I respect that answer. <laughs> yeah. Of course, more like, more like what was on, and then Five. the Alwee Caves is where they filmed the one with uh Victor Meldrew. I don't it? believe it, I don't believe mm. that was the Alwee Caves. It's getting like, I mean, you're just going to you're just going to get into it now if we just pull out all the locations that Father Ted has been filmed in. And have you or haven't you been there? I know Graham Norton, Brendan Grace, were in Father Ted. There you go. Oh, oh yeah, they were Tom, Tommy two. Tiernan was in it. There's yeah. lots of people in it, yeah. Jason Byrne. There's, I was very tempted to actually give you the Brendan Grace episode, but I think we'll still go with Chris the Sheep. Um, Chris the Sheep, I have to say. One final question, one for you, Scott, because I do want to go and actually watch this Sunday game now. Are you coming to Tullamore this weekend for the under-20 Leinster quarterfinal? Um, I'm not sure because we're on with the minors on Monday. So in terms of preparation, mm. I'm not sure where we get get to that. Um, I think we're heading see. towards Port Leash country. But uh, I'd say I could be knocking around the, the, the vicinity. <laughs> drop drop, drop me a text if you're going to go I'm going to go and watch this uh, go in Offaly game on Saturday lads it's been a pleasure we'll speak to you next week at the end of uh, round number two and thanks for everyone who's been taking part across the Facebook and YouTube over the last while as well we'll speak to you next week OTB's The Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship